Jimenez. Perales. Perales is here. Diep. Uh, here. Carrasco. Davis. Here. Esparza. Here. Arenas. Bully. Here. Camus. Jones. Present. Licardo. Present. Thank you, Tony. Uh, so we'll call the City Council study session to order uh, for the Deardon Station Area Planning and Downtown West Mixed Use Development uh, for the afternoon of November 16th. I know there is a very extensive presentation here coming uh, from staff. Uh, and so I believe the way we're going to proceed, everyone should see the agenda there with um, five key elements that staff is going to present, and then we'll go to council discussion. Ideally, I'd like to be able to limit the council questions to about an hour so we have some time for public input um, and appreciate that even the public input will also be a bit constrained in this study session. Uh, we've had more than 100 public meetings so far. We are going to have many more, including this week, uh, for there to be more opportunities for public input. So I want to apologize in advance for those uh, who may be constrained in terms of the duration of their public statements. But this study session is primarily going to serve to get public information out to the community and to the council. Uh, and then we are obviously going to continue with our very extensive public engagement process uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Um, so with that, uh, I want to thank everyone for joining. Uh, Dave, did you want to kick off? Yeah, actually, I'm just going to pass it off to Deputy City Manager Kim Walsh to, to start the, the presentation. Great. Great. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Dave. I am Kim Wallish, the Deputy City Manager, um, and it's really my pleasure to welcome you to this study session this afternoon about planning and development in the Deardon Station area. Um, we do have interpretation services available in Spanish and Vietnamese. And I would just like now to ask the interpreters to, to read the slide, um, maybe starting with Spanish and then going to Vietnamese. I think we're having a hard time. Uh, Henry, are, are the interpreters on in the speaker they, panel? They are, and the I just checked the other two lines. They're saying them into the interpretation line. I do need them, um, if interpreters, if you could switch over and say them on the English channel. Yes. La interpretación en simultáneo para esta reunión. La interpretación en simultáneo para esta reunión se dará en los siguientes idiomas. I don't hear them in the Spanish channel either. Yeah. Um, Armando? Okay, I'll, I will go ahead and do it. This is Vincent. La interpretación en simultáneo para esta reunión se dará en los siguientes idiomas. Español, bajo la opción español. Por favor, haz clic en el icono Interpretation en tu barra de herramientas para acceder al idioma deseado. Thank you. Can one of the Vietnamese interpreters read the Vietnamese one on the English channel? Yes. Thưa kính thưa quý vị, uh, chúng tôi có phiên dịch đồng thời cho cuộc họp này uh, và sẽ được cung cấp bằng ngôn ngữ tiếng Việt. Uh, xin quý vị chọn uh, ngôn ngữ tiếng Việt và vui lòng nhấp vào biểu tượng interpretation. Thank you, Councilmember Diep, for jumping in. <laughs> and did you guys hear the Spanish one? I heard it on the English channel. Uh, I don't believe I heard the Spanish. Am I mistaken? I, I, well, I was switched I, over to the English. There was no Spanish. Did, yeah, there's no, there no Spanish on the English channel. Espanol. You to Can you hear me? me? To the English, so I'm going to go ahead and say. Hello? The interpretation is simple. Can you hear me? The inter no, they are there. Just, I don't know if they're. If I can hear. Yeah. I can go ahead yeah. and do that. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, 
Wonderful. La interpretación en, en simultánea para esta reunión se dará en los siguientes idiomas. Español. Esto es bajo la opción español. Por favor, uh, haga un clic en el icono interpretación en la barra de herramientas para acceder el idioma deseado. Thank you. Okay, we're Great. off. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. So I would just like to start by acknowledging the amazing staff team that is behind all of the progress you'll hear about this afternoon. More than 80 staff from nine departments have been involved with the various planning and development projects working together as one interdisciplinary team. I, I know everyone knows this has been a uniquely strange and stressful year, so I just want to especially acknowledge the quality and quantity of the work and the commitment to it by the staff involved. Our team is very aware that we're working on one of the most station, most important station area planning projects happening in the world today. So it's really been a privilege and our opportunity. And you'll see our presentation this afternoon really showcases a variety of staff presenters. Our agenda for today, next slide please. Our purpose is really to provide an update on progress in advance of staff bringing a set of recommendations to council for consideration next spring. City Council gave very specific direction to staff in December of 2018, and we've been following that direction. So please think of this as a, a comprehensive progress report. For the public that's watching, uh, I also want to emphasize this study session is just for learning and understanding and to hear feedback. There will be no council action taken today. So if you see the agenda, I'm going to start by reminding us of kind of where we've been, give you an overview, looking back of the work that has gone on, and also give you a sense of what we anticipate looking forward the next six months and beyond. And then you can see that we have three major sections to the presentation. We're going to talk about amending the Deardon Station Area Plan and all associated planning work for the Deardon Station Area. And then we're going to talk about Google's proposed Downtown West Mixed Use Project, the process of conducting development review of that project and negotiating the development agreement. Now, as the mayor said, we're going to do a continuous presentation. We think it's best to sort of lay out everything at once. So it will be about an hour and 30 minutes. And so the benefit of Zoom is that you can take a break when you need to, but we thought it was best to tell the whole story in an integrated way. Council members, I also want to note that all the slides are numbered. So feel free to jot down notes and we can always go back and pop up slides um, at the end. And after our presentation, we're going to have time for council questions and feedback. And we're looking for what do you like about the progress that has been made? Are we meeting your expectations? But also what concerns you? What ideas, issues, expectations do you have that we should be aware of? And then last, we will take public comment. So let's start with a little bit of, of looking back. So as you know, the city's general plan welcomes substantial new growth in housing and jobs and focuses this growth around transit especially in our downtown. We've always known that our historic downtown, which is the area in the yellow on the slide, is quite small for a city of our size. So it has long been our city plans to expand downtown west and to integrate it with the Deardon Station area, which is the green area on the slide. Uh, so as you can see, it's about a mile long north to south, and it's about 250 acres. And it is home to two very important anchor institutions, the SAP Arena and the Deardon Transit Center. Next slide. So already, this area is the South Bay's most important transit hub. But for years, we've been planning it to also become a critical node in the Bay Area and California rail networks. It's a very unique crossroads 
in that it will be the only rail station in Northern California where Caltrain, BART, high-speed rail, and other key commuter rail services will, will all connect. So we are actually planning for an eight-fold increase in the number of trips that begin or end at Deer Don Station in San Jose on a typical weekday, from 17,000 trips currently to 140,000 daily trips in the future. So we realized we would need a new intermodal station to support the improved transit service. Next slide. So we have been partnering with Caltrain, VTA, and High Speed Rail for over a decade. But in 2018, we formed a particular partnership to plan the design of the new intermodal station and to plan for integrated transit service and urban development. Now we've come to call this DISC for, sh for short, which stands for Deardon Integrated Station Concept. And we call it this because this was really the first deliverable of this partnership. You will recall in January of this year, the City Council and the other partners chose this concept layout, which was developed with extensive community input. And we chose this layout because the main track approaches in the north and the south had the least impact on urban neighborhoods and development. The tracks generally stay within the existing rail corridors. Next slide. So despite the existing transit access and the proximity to downtown, this station area has long been underutilized relative to its potential. If you've been there, you see a lot of surface parking lots and a lot of old underutilized industrial buildings. So after five years of community input, including a good neighbor committee, in 2014, the city council adopted the station area plan. And this plan called for transforming this 250 acre area into a vibrant transit oriented Western district of downtown. And the vision was it would be a place for all San Jose residents to use and enjoy. And really a great mix of housing, offices, shops, lively public spaces, an emphasis on walking, biking, and transit, and a place that can really reflect and connect uh, our community and bridge to nearby areas. Now to actually implement this plan, <laughs> We recognize that we would need private development partners. The plan also recognized that the core part of this district needed to be designed and developed in a cohesive and integrated way, not a piecemeal parcel by parcel way. If we were going to ensure the kind of high quality public realm connectivity and amenities that the community wanted, um, we needed to have a cohesive, integrated, master-planned approach. Now, the problem at the time we were all wrestling with was this area was characterized by lots of small parcels owned by a variety of private and public owners. And after redevelopment agencies were ended in 2011 by the state of California, the city had no tools that it could use to purchase property for land assembly or to incentivize developer interest. So in early 2017, Google announced their interest in our station area plan and in developing offices in the Deardon area. In my view, this was quite remarkable because it was unique in Silicon Valley to have a major tech company intentionally want to locate near major transit and in a real city center. And it became a solution to our fragmentation problem because a company like Google could have the resources to assemble enough properties without subsidy or incentive to realize our vision. So in June of 2017, the city council gave direction to explore potential sale of public property and to identify shared goals for a potential development with Google. This was called the ENA, the Exclusive Negotiations Agreement. And council stipulated no incentives or subsidies and that Google must pay fair market value for the land. 
Now the public properties we discussed were located within the overall footprint of land that Google had been acquiring from private owners. So taken together, there would be enough contiguous land to have a cohesive master plan approach to the development. So after this happened, the city and Google were very interested in hearing from the community early and often to shape this potential project. So in early 2018, the city launched the engagement process to affirm the vision for the station area and to solicit ideas for Google's development. And you can see from the slide here in the first 10 months alone, um, all of the activities took, that took place including the creation of the Deer Don Station Area Advisory Group with 30, 38 members. That met uh, 10 times in full, uh, 11 times in small groups in that first 10 months alone. We also hired a full-time civic engagement manager, Lori Severino. And the first year of engagement culminated in a very important comprehensive civic engagement report which was an important input to your city council decision-making in December of 2018. In December of 2018, uh, council uh, adopted a memorandum of understanding, which we call the MOU, and the community input informed the development of this MOU. And the MOU, it laid out a shared vision for the development project it laid out guiding principles that include a balancing of placemaking, social equity, economic development, environmentally sustainability, and financially viable private development. Uh, and in the MOU, we agreed to innovate, collaborate, and to negotiate a development agreement, which would include a community benefits plan. And this M next slide, please. The MOU includes 18 shared goals that we have all been working to figure out how to achieve. Next slide. So along with the MOU, in December of 2018, the City Council approved sale of public lands at fair market value to Google. Now with the end of redevelopment, the City Council was already required by the State of California to sell former redevelopment agency properties for economic development purposes. These are the ones in yellow on the slide. These are smaller um, disconnected properties that totaled, totaled 6.5 acres. The city also sold the 4.3 acre fire training site that is the one on the southern end in blue. Now the city had long wanted to relocate this fire training site out of the urban area and the sale proceeds finally made this possible. We are now in the process of designing to build a new training center in a better location. The decision also provided Google with an option to purchase the 10 acre contaminated capped off surface parking lots next to SAP Center uh, in the future. Now it's important to remind you that professional appraisers were used by the city and county to determine the fair market sales price which was $237 per square foot. And what was remarkable at the time was this was two and a half times higher than prior property sales and appraisals just one year before. So the next thing that happened was that in early 2019, Google assembled a team to start preparing a development plan. And in fall of 2019, they submitted their initial application to the city. Now on the staff side, we were very happy that Google's master plan included land uses for up to San Jose, là nhân viên của thành phố San Jose rất là hài lòng về cái dự án mà công ty Google đưa ra ở phía tây của San Jose. Now this was much more mixed use than the city's original thinking, but we really welcome rất là có những cái uh, sự mà gọi là mixed use tức là ở dưới là thương mại ở trên là nhà ở có ba cái đoạn đường để đến cái việc thực hiện này đó là thứ nhất là uh, bắt đầu uh, chuẩn bị cho những cái uh, dự án rồi cái đến là xem lại những cái vấn đề môi trường môi sinh và cái cuối cùng là 
đồng ý trên căn bản trên các cái sự phát triển of several important area planning efforts which are all being coordinated. chuẩn bị có những cái nỗ lực tích cực vấn đề kế hoạch hóa cái khu vực mà họ đã mua từ thành phố San Jose. So Google is 80 acres of the 250 acre Deerdon station area. So there are có được là 88 uh, acres so với cái uh, ga station here đó là 150 acres. Một thu năm ngoái, um, thành phố San Jose đã uh, đề ra một số ngân sách để uh, lo cho cái uh, ga Meridian số 24. And an infrastructure plan. Và you can also có, uh, những cái dự án để có phát triển về nhà cửa ở trong khu vực đó. Quý vị cũng thấy có cái downtown uh, transportation plan đó là về vấn đề giao thông ở downtown. So because it's too complicated, we color code it all just like gar animals so that we can... Um, quý vị có thể thấy được cái sự phức tạp của cái uh, kế hoạch của cái dự án này bởi vậy chúng tôi có rất là nhiều uh, những cái giai đoạn uh, và những cái kế hoạch để có thể thực hiện được cái dự án này. Và đây là những cái uh, uh, sự mà gọi là kết nối với cộng đồng về mà công chúng để qua cái quá trình quá trình kết nối làm việc với nhau thì bắt đầu từ năm 2018 uh, là bắt đầu uh, chuẩn bị điểm. Kim, I'm sorry, we just wanted to see the clip. I need to interrupt you for just a second. I texted the interpreters. I don't know if they received it. They're accidentally interpreting on the English channel, and I need them to switch back over to the Vietnamese channel. I appreciate So I just, nobody can hear you speaking. So that's why I'm sorry. Okay. Do you think it's fixed now or do you have a way of confirming that they um, can? I'm going to switch over to the English channel and hear, see if I can hear. Go ahead and talk. Okay. I will keep talking. So you see on the slide what the engagement process has been. Okay. It, it seems to be working. Thank you. Excellent. So of course in 2020 with COVID, we had to shift to virtual civic engagement. We've still been able to reach a lot of people and are getting a lot of participation, in some cases even more, um, now that transportation has been removed as a barrier to some, to some folks. So we continue with the civic engagement. This next slide summarizes all of the engagement that the city has conducted over the last two and a half years. We have made an extra effort to reach out beyond the usual community participants, and we can talk more about this later. But these are the summary statistics of the city's outreach. Google has been doing additional outreach. You're gonna hear throughout the presentation how the community input has influenced our plans. But at a very, very high level, there's four themes. People are very excited about opportunities for neighborhood improvement and public life and public spaces, including trails, and the replacement of parking lots with active uses and public spaces. They're concerned not about social equity, which, which comes in a variety of ways, about anti-displacement, about opportunities for local residents, about accessibility to this area for everyone, and about homelessness. They want transit and transportation systems to work better, for it to be easy and safe to get to and around this area, And then we've been collecting a, a lot of specific ideas about designing for sustainability, for compatibility with surrounding neighborhoods, for safety. Well, as I said, we're at a really critical point where we hit a huge milestone this fall with the release of draft documents that build on all of these inputs. They include Google's Downtown West project 
application submittal and the environmental impact report in draft form. It also includes the draft amended Deardon Station Area Plan and the draft affordable housing implementation plan. Next slide. So this fall, we have a variety of engagement opportunities available to reflect and receive input on these milestone documents. Next slide. So this final push, which includes community meetings, partner events, commission meeting, meetings, online videos and online feedback forms, is a big chance for a lot of final public review. So that will happen in fall of 2020. In winter, we will have the next meeting of the stationary advisory group, which we lovingly call the SAG, which will be a review of the development agreement recommended by staff. In spring, we will be doing all of the required public hearings for the area plan and for downtown west, and then proceeding to council. And of course, after that, this area will be built out and evolve over decades by Google and other developers. So with that overview, it's now my pleasure. Um, you can see on the agenda that we're now going to talk about the Deardown Station Area planning process, and Rosalind's going to kick off that work. So thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon. My name is Rosalind Huey, the Director for Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. Next slide. So as a reminder to the City Council and to the members of the public, we want to share why we need to amend the Deridon Station Area Plan. There actually have been several changes since the City Council approved the plan back in 2014. First, the city is no longer planning for a ballpark. Uh, the city is now considering Google's mixed use development proposal. And we have the opportunity for increased heights and development capacity. And the city has initiated other plans in the Deridon area, including the Deridon Integrated Station Concept Plan or DISC, the Downtown Transportation Plan, and the Deridon Affordable Housing Implement Implementation Plan. The City Council has also adopted other policies and plans, such as the Downtown Design Standards and Guidelines, Climate Smart San Jose, and Activate San Jose. Next slide. Our community engagement with the Station Area Advisory Group, the general public, and many stakeholders affirm the general vision to transform the station area into a dynamic, mixed-use urban neighborhood anchored by a world-class transportation hub and the SAP Center. We did, however, adapt the objectives, themes, and goals to embody the overall spirit and characteristics the community indicated that were very important. The amendment process is also an opportunity to develop a sustainable and equitable plan around Deridon Station to allow more urban vitality, economic activity, and to act as a catalyst for similar development in surrounding neighborhoods. Achieving these goals requires adding capacity for both housing and office development through increasing building height limits, but we took great care to consider the specific context of each site when determining its redevelopment potential and appropriate height limits. The draft amendment amended plan includes design standards and guidelines to supplement the existing downtown design document and to reflect the unique characteristics of the Deridon Station area. This planning process includes aligning the general plan land use designations with the recommended development program. The amended plan will continue to be used as the basis for reviewing applications for development projects and guiding future public infrastructure investments. So staff released the draft amended Deardon Station Area Plan three weeks ago on October 27th. The amendment document is organized into topical chapters, including station area development, open space and public life, and mobility. 
We are taking public comment on the amended Deridon Station Area Plan, as well as the draft affordable housing implementation plan now through January 8th. And staff is available to provide briefings to community groups and other stakeholders on these plans. Next slide. We have extended the boundary of the Deardon Station area, adding approximately 12 acres to include all of the Downtown West development proposal and areas planned for parkland acquisition. These areas are outlined in red on the map on the slide. Next slide. We have included new land use concepts in the Deardon Station area plan um, that reflects Google's Downtown West development proposal. It includes a greater mix of uses and flexibility on some sites. It considers compatibility with adjacent uses, including the airport and freeways. And finally, it reflects the city's policies and goals for both jobs and housing. I'm now going to turn over the presentation to Tim Rood, who will walk you through the key land use and design changes in the document. Thanks, Rosalind. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Tim Rood, Division Manager in Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. The draft amended Duradon Station Area Plan proposes three different classes of maximum building height limits taking into account the existing context, as well as the potential for financially viable private development on individual sites and blocks. This map shows the proposed maximum heights for the Downtown West project, as well as the rest of the Deridon Station area. In blue, proposed high rise heights would be allowed uh, to go up to the FAA maximum limit which ranges from about 170 feet in the north end of the project to about 295 feet in the south. Mid-rise areas shown in pink would have intermediate height maximums of 110 to 130 feet. And the orange transitional areas would have low, the lowest heights ranging from 65 to 90 feet. Changes in response to community input uh, are reflected in the current maximum building heights proposals relative to the initial proposals in spring 2020. Areas outlined in blue have reduced maximum heights. In these areas, heights are proposed to be kept the same as in the 2014 DSEC or Deridon Station Area Plan. So no change from existing regulations. Areas outlined in red have increased maximum allowable heights based on feedback from the Deridon Area Neighborhood Group and other stakeholders that full FAA heights would be acceptable in these areas. Finally, the green line shows a proposed new step back transition standard that would apply in the areas of greatest concern to the Deridon Area Neighborhood Group, and those are shown with the green line. As Rosalind mentioned, the draft station area plans urban design standards build on the downtown design guidelines and standards the council adopted in 2019, which currently apply to the Deardon station area. The pink and blue lines on this map show the proposed step back transition standards where taller buildings would be next to a lower height residential context. Next slide. This slide shows diagrams of the proposed height transition standards with a 75 degree step back plane beginning at 35 feet high and continuing all the way up to the FAA maximum. The three dimensional drawing shows how a viable high rise building on a mid rise base could fit within these standards. Next slide. An analysis of the maximum potential build out for different uses was developed for the Deridon Station Area Plan and analyzed in the Deridon Station Area Plan's environmental document. This table shows the maximum build out program for the Downtown West project, for the remainder of the Deridon Station Area, and the total maximum being analyzed for the Deridon Station Area as a whole. 
Next, Nicole Burnham from Parks and Recreation and Neighborhood Services will speak about the open space. Thank you, Tim. I'm Nicole Burnham. I'm a deputy director with the Department of Parks, Recreation and Neighborhood Services, and I will walk you through open space and public life section of the Dearden Station Area Plan. Next slide. As we look back at the input we got from the community with regard to parks and public space and what people would like to see in this area, um, what it, the common theme comes down to that the public indicated very clearly that they want safe, clean, well-connected, well-maintained public spaces. They also encouraged us to be thinking about how we manage our park spaces and maintain them and different ways of doing that that might be more, um, more effective or more um, than, the, than what we currently have um, with our traditional park system. Next slide. There were three key principles that uh, emerged uh, as we developed the plan and thought about what we were going to provide. Uh, 19 acres of easily accessible and well-connected public and private open spaces are presented in the plan. Um, completing the final sections of the Los Gatos Creek Trail is another important element uh, that we heard from the community and that we're proposing as part of the plan. And also the provision of a new regional community center. I'm gonna talk about each of these, all three of those in the next slides. The overall park uh, and plaza concept is one that centers around Deerden Station, which is really generally in the center of this figure. Um, with plazas and um, more urban park-like settings surrounding the station and surrounding the major transportation corridor of East Santa Clara Street. As you move further away from those urban cores um, and toward Los Gatos Creek, you see more um, increasingly nature-based and recreation-based uh, traditional, more traditional park type amenities, um, particularly in the areas west of um, the Downtown West project, we'd like to seek out property for more traditional park land that, um, to make sure those neighborhoods are fully served as well as those of the downtown area. Next. Los Gatos Creek Trail was an important piece of the puzzle for us as we move through this Downtown West project area. Uh, many of the elements of this trail are completed south of here. Um, and it was critically important to us that we connect the trail from um, its current end point, just north of Azare, all the way up to Confluence Point in Arena Green. So that's what we are proposing to do here. We are seeking, as we always do in our trail system, as many off-road connections as possible as part of this. Um, there will be intermediate sections that will be on-road because we do not have the property ownership now to make them off-road, but we will seek that in the future. And then another important element for us here is um, from San Fernando up to Arena Green, again, becomes a, a, um, a bit of a challenging area to navigate. And we wanna make sure the trail can be used as a through connector. Um, so we will seek to do probably an off-road flyover alignment. That's what we proposed in the Deer and Station Area Plan. That's a very long range plan. We think it's important that we be talking about it at this point. Next. The Regional Community Center, we know that with the capacity of housing in this area um, that is proposed, that we don't have enough community center space to, to serve the needs of our community. Um, our adjacent community centers or nearby community centers are at um, Roosevelt and Bascom, but there really is nothing that currently is able to serve the Rose Garden area, the Alameda area, so we will seek that in the, in the future through this area. Uh, also included in the public life section of this document is information on public art from our friends at the Office of Cultural Affairs. Um, three major elements um, or ideas and themes around the public art, uh, crossroads of engagement, which will be tied to active uses, innovation, which uh, works with art as infrastructure, um, and ecology, where we integrate art into the environment. Next slide. Uh, examples of each of these are shown here. So art as infrastructure, um, the um, ecology section uh, shown in, in, the, in the left hand slide. And then um, many of you will probably recognize Sonic Runway in the upper right. 
Um, that is the kind of art of engagement where we have active uses that draw people in. And then the element under um, Highway 87 is the, an example of combining art with infrastructure where we can light an area um, using some creativity um, and some art elements. And with that, I'm gonna turn it to Jessica Zink to talk through the mobility section. Good afternoon. As Nicole just mentioned, I'm Jessica Zank. I'm Deputy Director for the San Jose Department of Transportation. And I'm going to start uh, with what Kim also mentioned, which is that we have a lot of overlapping and important uh, work underway within this area. So starting at the center in the red, we have the Deardon Integrated Station Concept Plan, our effort with VTA, Caltrain, High Speed Rail, and the Metropolitan Transportation Commission to reimagine an integrated station. Moving out from there in the yellow and the green, we have the Downtown West project proposal nested within the Deardon Station Area Plan, and those are, of course, uh, the two primary topics for today. And finally, in the blue, we have the Downtown Transportation Plan. Again, this effort is underway to improve public life and access to and within our downtown. Next slide. With the Deardon Station at the heart of this whole area, we really wanted to start and focus um, on the concept layout centered around Deardon Station. Um, all of you probably are quite familiar with the station today, it has a beautiful historic depot uh, I wanted to acknowledge that we don't see that in this uh, drawing because of the expected need to expand rail service and uh, the platforms and tracks there. So we'll be looking for another way to honor that, uh, that building um, in the future phases of the Deardon Station concept work. The three decisions that the public agencies have made with the concept layout are to elevate the track for greater connectivity for our neighborhoods in the downtown, station entrances at Santa Clara Street and at San Fernando Street, and to focus the track expansion around the existing rail corridor to the north and the south. Next slide. There are four key principles that are the foundation of the proposed Deardon Station Area Plan in the mobility section. First is to really focus on bringing people together, which involves prioritizing people walking, people taking transit, people bicycling as these are the ways that people can get around in the greatest number while using up the least amount of precious urban land. Second is to focus on environmental and economic sustainability, emphasizing easy and clean access to transportation and mobility that is affordable. Third, foster community development, social interaction, public life, right? This is about people being able to know each other, to meet each other, to make eye contact while they get around the area. And last but not least, to promote social and economic equity within the station area, supporting the most inclusive and again, affordable access to transportation with health benefits as well. Next slide. This is the draft proposed street network within the Deardon Station area. This is largely consistent with the 2014 uh, Deardon Station area plan. Uh, it also incorporates and builds upon the proposals by the Downtown West project and the integrated station concept plan, focusing again on east-west connectivity under the tracks and completing the trail network and enabling some additional active greenways where people can move about. Next slide. The parking and transportation management sec section focuses on a district approach to comprehensively manage both public parking and transportation demand management policies. On the parking front, we recognize that public parking must be a shared resource in an area like this so new commercial parking is proposed to um, be required to share and make publicly available their parking. We're proposing to enter into shared parking agreements with existing landowners to encourage them to share parking as well. And to of course use pricing to efficiently manage the parking, especially to make sure that it's available for events at the SAP Center. We're proposing to unbundle or rent slash sell separately 
residential parking from the units to make that housing more affordable. And last, to establish a transportation management association to implement and monitor the TDM programs put into place. Now I will turn it back to Tim Rood for the next section. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Robert Meinford, and I'm Deputy Director for Planning. I'll start off by stating that the Derridon Station Area Plan, as amended, will be a sustainable plan in that it will embody the city's robust environmental plans and policies, including Climate Smart San Jose, which uh, measures uh, seeks to includes measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions resulting from energy and mobility and to conserve water. San Jose Rich Code and Natural Gas Infrastructure Prohibition Ordinances, which includes all electric buildings and EV charging infrastructure. Green Storm Water Infrastructure Plan, which improves the water quality of storm water runoff. And also the Green Building Policy, which includes varying lead certification requirements based on the project type. An important aspect of any planning effort in California, as we all know, is the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA. For the DSAP amendment, the CEQA compliance document that we have prepared is an addendum to the Downtown Strategy Environmental Impact Report. The Downtown Strategy 2040 EIR was certified by City Council in 2018, and it superseded the DSAP EIR, which was prepared in 2014, in providing program level review of all planned development in the Derridon Station area and its immediate environs. The decision to prepare uh, an addendum to the Downtown Strategy 2040 EIR is based on uh, an expanded initial study, which was prepared by a consultant. And as part of our records, we've included a technical memo on the CEQA approach for the DSAP amendment, which was provided by the consultant. In addition to the technical memo, there's also substantial evidence in the records to support preparation of an EIR addendum. I will now pass it on to um, Ms. Jackie Ferrand for, uh, to, to discuss the affordable housing component of this uh, effort. I'll also note that planning staff is available for all questions or any questions that may come up regarding the environmental review process. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'm Jackie morales Ferrand, and I am the Director of Housing. And um, the Housing Department recently released, released the draft Deardon Affordable Housing Implementation Plan. The plan was drafted by our consultants from Strategic Economics, and the staff lead was Kristen Clements from the Housing Department. Today, I'm going to cover the highlights of the plan. We will be accepting comments in the plan um, until January 8th of 2021. And we have a link on the website where you can download the plan or view it publicly. We are collecting comments and questions through an online feedback form, which is again, can be found on these links. And there's going to be many opportunities to provide this feedback during this fall uh, while we have extensive community meetings. We will consider the feedback, make changes to the draft plan, and submit a final report for the city's council of consideration in spring of 2021. Next slide. The plan focuses on the three housing P's, which you have seen before. First, we want to produce more subsidized housing overall. Second, we want to preserve housing that is currently affordable to lower income households and moderate income households. Third, we want to help protect renters from displacement through policies and programs. While the City Council directed us to focus on production, we integrated um, the other two P's in order to address both neighborhood and community concerns. Next slide. Geographically, the three P's are focused in two different areas. Production will be focused in the Deardon Station area boundary, which is the black, uh, dark black line. And then preservation and protection will be focused on the half mile buffer around the Deardon Station area. And that is that dotted line that you can see. 
We selected this half mile distance for preservation because there was evidence for research from BART that there is a price effect at a half mile radius. We, it's also important to note that the displacement strategies that are contained in the draft report align with the citywide residential anti-displacement strategy that the city council passed on September 2nd. Next slide. This slide summarize, summarizes the heart of what the draft housing plan recommends. For the De Deardon station area, we have a goal of 25% of all housing will, will be restricted at build out serving a range of extremely low income households to moderate households. And just to give you an example of what we're talking about, a family of three who's considered extremely low income would earn close to $42,000. And for a moderate family of three, almost $153,000. For the neighborhood stabilization area, we wanna preserve the affordability of existing deed restricted units in the DSA, um, which also helps us to achieve our production goal. We want to decrease the percentage of severely cost burdened renter to households, which means renters who are earning, who are paying more than 50% of their income towards rent. Um, and we want to establish a preservation pilot program to acquire and rehabilitate existing multifamily units that are affordable to lower income households and convert them to long-term deed restricted affordable apartments. In addition, this plan proposes to track the number of Latinx and black residents in this area over time. These two groups were selected because they have significant housing barriers, have suffered disproportionately from the recent COVID pandemic and constitute a sizable share of the total San Jose population. Next slide. So these are the seven strategies that we would like to implement under our production. Uh, one, we wanna prioritize sites within a walking distance, which is a half mile of the Deardon station for affordable housing development to maximize competitiveness. Two, we wanna partner with transit agencies and developers to apply for as much state funding for transit oriented affordable housing. Three, we're going to adopt the updates to the inclusionary housing ordinance, which you will see early next year. Four, we're gonna update regulations to facilitate lower cost construction te technologies such as mass timber and modular. Five, we wanna prioritize the use of commercial linkage fee revenues generated in the DSA for affordable housing projects within the area. Six, we wanna explore potential changes to park fees. And this is the park fees that we recommended under the inclusionary housing to decrease overall development costs for our affordable housing that is income indeed restricted for moderate. And lastly, we wanna support policies that increase the production of ADUs in the Deardon Station area and surrounding neighborhoods because of the number of single family homes that were uh, found in this particular area. Next slide. In terms of preservation, as I've talked about, we do want to establish a preservation pilot program. And we're thinking about the same program that you already uh, asked us to look at in our anti-displacement program. We think it would be a perfect fit for this area because of the number of smaller multifamily apartments that are already located in this area. Two, in order to do this, we do need to develop that ecosystem in order to support the work. We need flexible funding, and that includes the just passed um, investment plan. So we want to use Measure E funds to acquire and rehab potentially in this area. And then lastly, policies and programs like the COPA, which was the community opportunity to purchase, can help make others aware that buildings are for sale and tenant preferences could help local residents to take advantage of these apartments once they become vacant. Next slide. And then finally, under protection, we do wanna support legal services for tenants who are facing eviction. Uh, we wanna consider options for locally enforcing any kind of state regulation to make it easier for our residents to understand what protections they do have We'd like to consider expanding our tenant protection ordinance to include duplexes, which when this was earlier brought to the housing department, we didn't have the resources to do it, but we believe we can do it now. 
and we want to expand or consider expanding our apartment rent ordinance to include renter occupied duplex units. And then lastly, we want to make it easy for people in this area to better understand what's available to them by considering creating a satellite office in this area so that people don't have to rely to going downtown or just using technologies that they may not feel comfortable with. So with that, I will now turn it over to Kim. Great, thank you, Jackie. Um, Council, you may recall in March 2019, you approved lifting the airspace restrictions in the Deardon Station area. As part of that action, you also directed staff to analyze the potential for an incentive zoning program in the station area. Incentive zoning programs are an option that are given to developers to get additional height allowed for their project in exchange for public benefits like affordable housing. For an incentive zoning program to be feasible, the project at the higher height has to be more valuable than the project at the existing height. So we explored this idea with our consultants, HRNA, and as part of the memo for the study session, there's a link to the technical memo. But I wanted to summarize high level the three main findings. The first finding is that our city already now has powerful mechanisms in place to capture value from development. By that I'm referring to the combination of the inclusionary housing ordinance, the new commercial linkage fee, and the Deardon infrastructure impact fees. So taken together, these achieve the same basic objective as an incentive zoning program, but they're not optional, they're required, and that's better. Second finding is there's clearly, there's no more value to capture on housing. Our city has very aggressive affordable housing and parks fees on housing, there's no value there. There may be some nominal value to capture on office. Um, and it would make sense to revisit in a few years when we know what the additional infrastructure impact fee is going to need to be and what class A rents turn out to be in the downtown area. So in a few years, uh, you could achieve the same objective by considering an increase in the commercial linkage fee for downtown office if that was feasible. And the last point the memo makes is that these incentive zoning programs are very complex to administer. They're legally challenged, challenged now to do in California and can have the unintended consequence of discouraging density and creating an uneven playing field between the Deardon Station and the downtown core. Next slide, please. So also in December 2018, you directed us to explore citywide strategies and financing tools to mitigate potential small business displacement. As a result of that direction, we've developed new approaches for small business anti-displacement and are using them in the Alum Rock area where there's potential for displacement due to future BART station. So we are doing an analysis of displacement potential and how to use these tools and lessons learned also in the Deardon Station area. And as part of our fall uh, engagement activities, we're going to share this analysis and have focus group discussions on this topic as well as an online feedback form for people that are interested in the topic of small business displacement and small business opportunities. And I have one more slide, please, that just shows um, just very high level. You can see these are all the active small businesses in the Deardon Station area and the broader study area that we're looking at. And last, then to close out this section of our presentation, it's my pleasure to introduce Lori Severino, who I mentioned earlier is our Deardon Station Civic Engagement Manager. Hi, good afternoon, City Council. Uh, thank you, Kim. And uh, just to repeat, my name is Lori Severino with the Office of Economic Development. And my title is Deardon Program Manager, and I've been leading the community engagement efforts uh, for the Deardon Station area. So as Kim mentioned earlier, we are hosting a series of engagement events this fall to share information and gather feedback on the draft amended Deardon Station Area Plan and draft Deardon Affordable Housing Implementation Plan. This includes a virtual community meeting on December 3rd, community partner events, 
and commission meetings. Events that have already occurred are shown in italics here. The documents, online feedback forms, and event info are all available at the webpage listed at the top of the screen, deardonsj.org backslash fall 2020. And staff is requesting comments by January 8th in order for staff to consider the input in making changes to the plans and preparing recommendations. To reiterate, the, the target for the public hearing process for these plans is spring 2021, leading to city council decisions. So I'll now turn it back to Rosalind to talk about the development review process for the proposed Downtown West project. Thank you, Lori. Uh, so we wanted to provide the council um, and the public just a reminder of what's included in the Downtown West Mixed Use Development Project. Um, so as you recall, the project contains about um, 80 acres um, and you can see that highlighted in yellow on the map um, on the slide. Uh, and the site is within the Deridon Station area boundaries based on the draft amended DSAP. Next slide. The development program for the project uh, includes 4,000 homes, up to 7.3 million square feet of office space, approximately 500,000 square feet of active uses, 15 acres of open space, and plans for transportation and infrastructure. Next slide. As Kim Wallace previously shared, there are three pathways for the project. First is the development review process, which includes things like the design standards, zoning and policy analysis, the environmental review component, which is a preparation of uh, environmental impact report, and then a development agreement, which uh, negotiations of community benefits and other terms of development to give both the city as well as Google certainty. Next slide. So this slide shows um, the key milestones in the downtown West mixed use project timeline. We began with community engagement and adoption of a memorandum of understanding back in 2018. Google then submitted uh, their initial application in October of 2019, which actually started the official development review and environmental review processes. And city staff and the Google team have been working to get to this next major milestone of releasing the draft environmental impact report along with the draft design standards and guidelines and infrastructure components of the proposal. Staff's recommended development agreement will be shared in early 2021, followed by public hearings and final um, action by the council in spring of 2021. If approved, then Google and their partners will submit building design review documents for conformance review. Last steps would be building permit applications and subsequent construction. We anticipate that build out will be over time and it could take from 10 to 30 plus years. The city has conducted public outreach and community engagement to each one of these steps and we will continue to do so throughout the process. Next slide. So while the city has conducted community engagement throughout the process, we're very delighted that Google has hosted their own outreach and uh, community engagement events. Um, I just wanna note on this slide that um, with the release of videos on the project that they've received about 14,000 hits thus far. So we're learning that um, providing these videos um, on the website has been an effective tool. Next slide. So listed on this slide are the various components of the resubmittal of Google's project. And they include the plan development zoning application, the plan development permit, which includes the design standards and guidelines. The proposal also includes amendments to the general plan, the Deridon Station area plan, the San Jose Water Company landmark boundary and historic preservation permit, as well as the seven Pacific depot landmark boundary. The application also includes uh, improvement standards, 
and an infrastructure plan as well as a vesting tentative map. Next slide. The Downtown West Design Standards and Guidelines is a comprehensive document with specific chapters. Um, this document is actually one of the key components of the overall development application. Um, all of the components of the application have been posted to the project website, and we have provided several resources to help members of the public review and understand the material. A feedback form is located on the project website, and Google has included a digital engagement exercise on their project webpage as well. Next slide. So we want to share with you a little bit about um, the building design review process. So as well as background, the typical planning and building process in the city is for one building or perhaps a few buildings at a time. Staff reviews a planning application in conformance with the general plan and related city policies, design standards and guidelines, and zoning regulations, which include development standards. After planning entitlement approval, applicants then obtain building permits to construct their projects. Next slide. The implementation of the Downtown West project will occur in phases, as we've mentioned. The project actually includes 30 plus buildings, over three miles of street improvements, 10 different parks, um, and again, as we mentioned, will happen, uh, will be developed over a period of time. So because of the size and scale of the proposed project, a conformance review process is being proposed. This approach is a hybrid between the single building process, which I described in the previous slide, and the specific plan or urban village plan process, which sets very high level land use and general building controls. Google's updated application submittal goes into greater details about the conformance review process and illustrates the development of the overall site. Similar to other large scale projects, the Downtown West project includes a planned development zoning district, which is a customized zoning district. It establishes a general development plan that lays out land use, permit type, development standards, and development capacity. And given the size of the project, additional development standards include circulation, open space, and infrastructure. The plan development permit is the regulatory document that implements the plan development zoning and includes more details on the build out of the project. For Downtown West, it includes a comprehensive set of design standards and guidelines. The Downtown West Design Standards and Guidelines will build upon the existing Downtown Design Standards and Guidelines that the City Council adopted in 2019, and it adds site specific site design controls tailored to the project and cross-referencing the City's Downtown Design Standards and Guidelines. Next slide. So following planning entitlement phase, the city would use the Downtown West Design Standards and Guidelines in the plan development permit to conduct the design review of individual buildings and their site plans. Google and its team would develop specific site plans for buildings and phases over time, as we mentioned, and then they would submit an application for conformance review to the planning division that includes the site plans and specific building design for individual buildings or phases. This conformance review will analyze for completeness and compliance with the plan development zoning, the plan development permit, and specifically the downtown West design standards and guidelines and the general plan. Staff would then prepare a staff report and hold a public meeting to get uh, comments and feedback. If the application conforms with the Downtown West Design Standards and Guidelines and the general plan, then the detailed design would continue without any further discretionary action, and the process would then go to building permit process. 
Next, Tim Brood will now share more details about the design, about the Downtown West design standards and guidelines and actually walk us through an example. Thanks, Rosalind. The next few slides will share some highlights of the draft design standards and guidelines and how they would apply to different areas within Downtown West. The design controls include provisions for active ground floor uses and frontages, building height and massing controls, including skyline massing bulk limits for buildings larger than those that would otherwise be permitted under the existing downtown guidelines and standards, and strategies like preferred building materials. Next slide. This diagram shows where the active ground floor uses would be concentrated, either in standalone structures, such as those along Autumn Street at the Creekside Walk, or as part of the ground floor of new buildings, where indicated by the red and orange outlines. Next. This is a three-dimensional view showing some of the bulk and ground floor and height articulation strategies as they apply to the whole of the project. Next. Within the allowable maximum FAA height limit range of approximately 180, 180 feet at the north end to 290 feet at the south end, the project is proposing a range of heights by retaining some lower structures along Montgomery Street and Autumn Street and by tapering building heights in other areas. Next slide. As an example, the two sites, uh, part of the former Trammell Crow project, uh, north of the light rail station um, adjacent to uh, the 87 freeway and the Guadalupe River, or known as sites E2 and E3 in the design standards and guidelines. This first image just shows the starting building bulk envelope that would be taken by extruding the entire site up to the maximum height limit. The next slide shows the additional bulk controls that are proposed by the design standards and guidelines, including setbacks adjacent uh, to the Lake House Historic District. Next. Within that allowable building envelope, the actual building design could take many possible forms, just a few of which are illustrated here. Next. The next few images are intended not to show specific building designs, but to rather show the look and feel of development as it blends into the existing context. This view is looking east along San Fernando Street with the Lake House Historic District on the right, the light rail station uh, to the left, and then new development um, rising up in accordance with the design standards and guidelines. Next. This proposed plaza near the water company building shows how the taller building, uh, the new taller building visible to the right, would have specific design responses encoded into the design standards and guidelines, including ground floor articulation and horizontal articulation to respond to the height of the adjacent historic building. You can also get a sense of the envisioned public life in these new public spaces. Next. And this is showing some of the design standard and guideline provisions that would apply, including transparency, active use percentage minimums, bird safe glass, and a, uh, a step back plane uh, to reflect the adjacent historic building massing, as well as rehabilitation of the water company building itself. The goal is to create immersive natural environments and the design standards and guidelines include controls not just for buildings but also for streets and parks uh, within the Downtown West project. Next slide. So the ecological controls include things like riparian plantings, prohibitions on amplified noise, 
appropriately ecologically sensitive lighting, limitations on programming within the riparian setback, and then the adjacent ecological enhancement zone. Next. And again, these public spaces within the project are really envisioned as being areas that are part of San Jose and are welcoming to all. So there's a fair amount of detail about the design of these open spaces and the adjacent buildings and their ground floor frontages. Next. So here you can see um, examples of active programs that could be developed within that ecological enhancement zone to raise awareness of and appreciation for the natural environment. Um, interpretive wayfinding integrated into the project. Uh, street trees contributing to a riparian planting strategy and height and footprint limits on the existing buildings uh, that propose to be retained. Next. Next, Nicole will speak about the open space uh, component of the project. Sure. Thank you, Tim. Again, Nicole Burnham with Parks and Recreation and Neighborhood Services. Um, so just as an overview, um, and Tim's slide, last slides are a great introduction to the open space strategies uh, for the Google development project, a very kind of rich um, public life, public realm, and also a rich ecologically based design uh, throughout the throughout the project. Um, starting at Deer and on Station, spaces are definitely more urban in nature, but as we move away, they will become, you know, more um, ecologically focused with more native, um, more native plantings, um, and uh, certainly a strong emphasis on the creek and enhancement of the creek. Next slide. This slide um, just presents an overview uh, breakdown of the different categories of open space and public space that are proposed as part of the project. So the pink two columns on the left are what will be is proposed to be city dedicated parkland. It's about 32% of the total. So the total proposed open space is 15 acres. Uh, the proposal for city dedication is 4.8 acres. Um, we're going to talk about those quite a bit in the next slide. So I'll focus um, just briefly on the five categories in orange. Um, the privately owned public space public parks are intended to be retained in Google ownership, but be publicly accessible. They will kind of look and feel and act a lot like public parks, um, but Google will own and, and manage them. Um, semi up public open space is that space that might be building frontage along some of the commercial, you know, active uses that you should, you could see in the slides Tim went through. Um, they might be cafe seating, um, and support the commercial uses that are adjacent. Um, about two and a half acres of the 15 is riparian corridor and or riparian setback. Uh, really important open space element as we think about the urban core and particularly important and interesting in this area where you know we, Los Gatos Creek through large portions of the project is really still a naturalized channel, which is exciting. And so the idea that we will, um, that it will be protected and preserved is, is exciting. Um, and then there's a category of mid-block passages and all of these are described in detail um, in the design guidelines. So for more information, you can go there, but the mid-block passages are exactly what they sound like. They are um, passages that might have commercial um, activity on the front of them, but generally they're moving people. Think about Paseo de San Antonio. Um, is is um, the the most logical kind of um, equal that we currently have. Next slide. So there are six discrete locations that are proposed as part of the of city dedication. Two of them are really dedicated to trail and the trail construction and providing us, as I mentioned earlier, that that getting us to that goal of the off road connected bike system. So to um, about a half acre worth of the 4.8 will be Los Gatos Creek Trail segments that are shown on this map. The other four are very diverse in nature, but they also um, have really present really different and interesting opportunities for the park system. So starting at the left-hand side of the page, the Los Gatos Creek connector, eight tenths of a mile, um, it will run behind the existing or the former Orchard Supply building. Um, just north of Osare uh, and with residential fronting on that proposed property. So lots of eyes on that space, walking trails, children's play areas. So 
um, a really interesting area for us. Um, the social heart, which is, is an area that we are also really excited about because it really is the heart of the project and it's really gonna be the heart of Deeradon Station too. Um, as we move forward and develop, there will be arts and cultures buildings surrounding that space. So um, it's an exciting opportunity for us as a, as a park system to have access to that space. The other two at the north end, north of Santa Clara and north of SAP, really act like more traditional parks. Um, they are larger swaths of green space. They are, they are um, you know, sort of standalone recreation spaces with lots of green area. You know, St. John Triangle at an acre and a half and North End Park at a little less than an acre and a half. So those are two really logical choices for city dedication. So um, the parkland dedication would include the dedication of these lands. And then as I think a lot of you folks know, um, when residential developers uh, are meeting their parkland dedication, they can meet it through dedication of land, through construction of parks, through improvements in existing parks or some combination of those. So the combination here would be the dedication of the parkland and the construction of the, of the park amenities. Next slide. And I touched on it earlier when we heard about the Dearden Station Area Plan um, is the idea around how are we going to operate and manage these spaces. I think Google has put forward some really innovative, interesting, and different ideas on, on how they want the parks and, and public spaces to function here. And we have been working closely with them on, on what that looks like and how we as a city um, can help them with that and how they can help us and we can work together so that we manage the city owned spaces in a way that's equitable with the privately owned spaces. So that's something we continue to explore. We don't have final solutions on it yet, but um, it might look like a conservancy. It could be some other management models that, that we look at going forward. And with that, I turn it to Jessica Zink to go through some of the mobility section. Excellent, thanks, Nicole. Jessica Zink, Department of Transportation. The Downtown West Design Guidelines and Standards Mobility Chapter really builds upon the Deardon Station Area Plan, as well as the city's complete streets standards and guidelines. It emphasizes streets that are for people whether they're walking, uh, walking to and from their destination, from transit or from where they parked their car or biking or scooting on protected bikeways, the streets are designed with people first in mind. A uh, second key emphasis is to build in flexibility. And, and I mean that in multiple ways, both to allow for uh, changes over time in the long run as changes in transport technology and options in the area progress as well as flexibility even from the morning to the evening because you might need to use that street differently for egress from the SAP center versus during the day when you could have a, a food truck here. Next. Here's a snapshot of the proposed roadway network for the Downtown West project. Um, all of the teal are existing public streets. The orange and yellow are new streets that are added and then the proposed for vacation or removal are the purple dashed lines. So it's really about making a resilient street network within this area uh, that can accommodate many needs over time. Next slide. The Downtown West project also studied uh, pretty extensively the uh, potential effects on the transportation and neighborhoods around the site. Uh, through that local transportation analysis, uh, the Downtown West project will be constructing or contributing to a variety of improvements, and those are mapped here. Uh, for example, uh, number one, just to take one, is uh, better connections, primarily for people walking as well as biking, um, from the Deardon area to the Gardner North Willow Glen neighborhoods south of 280. Uh, this is to ease longstanding safety concerns and make sure that people uh, say if they have students at Gardner Elementary, those students can get there safely and easily better than today. Next slide. And the Downtown West parking proposal is nested within the framework that I discussed earlier for the broader DSAP area. The Downtown West project will uh, share its parking within that district parking approach uh, it will provide at least 
2,850 spaces on site. So that's under proposed Google commercial buildings and up to 4,800 total spaces. So it's kind of a floor and a, and a ceiling within that. It also will commit to market rate demand-based pricing so that this parking can really be shared by people, whether they're visiting the offices, the retail, Deeridon Station, SAP Center, or other locations. On the residential front, the project proposes up to 2,360 total residential parking spaces. Um, those will be sold or leased separately from the housing itself to ensure affordability and also that people only need to purchase that parking space if they need it and want it. And now I'll turn it over to David Keon from the Planning Department. Good afternoon, City Council. David Keon, Principal Planner of the Planning Department of Planning, Building and Code Enforcement. I'm going to be talking about the draft environmental impact report and some of the sustainability measures of the Downtown West project. So the, the Downtown West project's in, draft environmental impact report was released to the public review on October 7th. Um, since that time, the public review period has been extended to December 8th, so a total review period of 61 days. Now, the draft EIR evaluates and discloses the environmental impacts of the project, including from construction. It identifies mitigation measures for significant impacts and evaluates project alternatives. Um, the EIR and all supporting documents can be found via links on the Google project website. Next slide, please. One of the unique, at, unique aspects of the Downtown West project is that it is certified as an environmental leadership and development project by, by the governor. This, this AB 900 it requires a high standard of public and environmental requirements um, for projects to demonstrate enhanced sustainability measures. And in turn, as a result, it also allows them to go through an expedited judicial review if the EIR is challenged. This ensures timely benefits. AB 900 does not reduce any of the requirements of the CEQA review process required of the California Environmental Quality Act. In fact, it requires enhanced public transparency, um, including the publication of the administrative record. This includes all documents related to the project produced by the city via an available link on the city's website that can be found on the Google Project website. Next slide, please. Now, the draft EIR has several topics that it analyzes. In fact, 15 topic areas as required by state law. Um, these include air quality, population housing, land use, transportation, cultural resources, among others. These, each of these topic areas is evaluated through impacts as required by state law, and the determination is made via the analysis to determine if each area has an impact relate, related to no impact or finding of significant impact with mitigation or significant unavoidable impact. Um, so each topic area, if you go through the EIR, you see these, you see these impact summaries. Um, I do want to bring to your attention that there are impacts that are identified as significant and unavoidable. Um, this means that when the, there's an impact that is identified, that there can be no, excuse me, that there can be no mitigation measures that reduce it to a less than significant level. These impacts are highlighted in orange on this slide. Next slide, please. As part of the AB 900 process, there's also several measures to enhance sustainability. Um, this is included in the design guidelines in the sustainability chapter and also under AB 900. One of the biggest highlights is the fact that the project will have no net increase in greenhouse gas emissions for 30 years. Another huge improvement for the project is the fact that they'll have very low vehicle miles traveled. Vehicle miles traveled means that automobile trips to the area will have reduced trip lengths because of the central location of the site. The site is also located with the Climate Smart San Jose goals, and the project is committed to, to achieve lead neighborhood development goal and lead goal for office development. In addition, the project will have significantly reduced waste as part of the AB 900 application, and also will have nearly all electric development and will plant more than a thousand new trees. Next slide, please. 
In addition, the project will have a very intense transportation demand management program. This includes such things as commuter benefits, transit passes, um, designated bike share, and commuter shuttles. Next slide. One key aspect of the Downtown West project is that it will have a district approach for the overall 80 acre site. This means there will be shared and connected utility services across the entire development. Um, a key component of this is that there will be central utility plants for, to heat and cool buildings. There will be an electric micro, microgrid with distributed energy sources, on-site processing of wastewater and reuse recycled water. And all this will be connected through an underground utility known as Utilidor. Next slide, please. In addition to the district systems, there will be other infrastructure elements. This includes upsizing the storm and sanitary systems, reconstructing the West San Fernando Street Bridge over the Los Gatos Creek, and hydraulic improvements to reduce overbank flooding during a 100-year flood event. And it also includes rehabilitating the Los Gatos Creek Channel to improve habitat. And now I'm going to pass it on to Lori. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, again, this is Lori Severino with the Office of Economic Development. So as I mentioned previously, we are hosting a series of engagement events this fall. And many of these events overlap with the ones I showed earlier for the Deardon Station area, as they offer opportunity to provide input on all of the draft plans and documents discussed this afternoon. We held a community meeting specifically on the Downtown West project on October 19th, and the Downtown West documents, online feedback forms, and event info are all available at the webpage listed at the top of the screen. So that's deardonsj.org backslash fall 2020. So in addition to the city-led engagement efforts, over the next several months, Google plans to host conversations with community members about public life, health and resilience, and opportunity pathways. Their project website is shown in the bottom right here g.co backslash San Jose. And so now I will turn it uh, to Nancy Klein to talk about the Downtown West Development Agreement. Good afternoon. I am so very happy to be here. I am the uh, Director of Economic Development and my name is Nancy Klein and you'll be happy to know that you've reached the last section of presentation from staff this morning or this afternoon. And hopefully you too are seeing why <clears throat> we're so excited to share with you the depth and breadth of work we've all been engaged in. What, um, next slide please. What I wanted to do was begin by sharing our team with you. On the city side of the negotiations team is myself, Kim Wallace, and Johnny Fan from the city attorney's office. But we have an extraordinarily smart and seasoned team. The uh, people here from HRNA advisors, Amitabh Barthaker, Judith Taylor, and Thomas Jansen are, are very, very skilled. And HRNA, in fact, has a very deep history of working on large scale projects that are often transit oriented and require a, a ton of working through complexity, such as the Washington DC Anacosta Waterfront Initiative, uh, community benefits for the downtown LA new community plan and transit oriented uh, projects with LA Metro as well as the LA Crenshaw LAX transit line and many more. And also very fortunate to have with us A.P. Hurd, who is a, a working developer who in the, in the last several years has been responsible for delivering over 2 million square feet of mostly tech office to companies like Amazon, Tableau Software, HBO, Redfin, and more. And she's worked on city and state policy related to affordable housing, transit, uh, development as well as sustainable development. Next slide, please. Now, right before we get to talking about development uh, uh, agreement 101, I wanted to share with you what we'll be talking about in this last section. <clears throat> I'm just going to review a little bit of the work uh, and a little bit of definitions. We're going to answer or give you information on what the city is getting out of the DA. We're going to talk about project and community benefits feasibility. 
And then we're going to talk about there are risks associated with the project, and we want to outline those for you. Here on this slide, on the Development Agreement 101, we, we want to share with the community that a development agreement will indeed be part of the approval package that is recommended to the Planning Commission. That'll happen, we anticipate, in March, and City Council in May. A development agreement is a contract between the city and a developer that it is adopted by ordinance and it's part of the process for approving the project. It, it identifies the obligations of both parties and gives the standards and condition or the rules that will govern the project throughout its life. A primary benefit to the developer of having a development agreement is certainty knowing the rules that will apply over the length of the development agreement. For the city, we too benefit from certainty, but we also gain from community benefits that come as a result of the development agreement. Next slide, please. The MOU anticipated that we would have a development agreement and community benefits. In the MOU, key topics that would be addressed in the development agreement were identified. Things like the length of the agreement, the vested project approvals, dedications of land, applicable laws, and much more, and including the community benefits requirements. Next slide, please. The MOU also recognized that the development agreement negotiations should take into account the financial feasibility of the Google project and the value created by the city for the project. And <clears throat> that we will continue to assess those and that's why it's taken uh, or will take a bit longer to determine the amount of community benefits. Next slide. This, we've come to love this slide, the public benefits framework it in a single slide puts together some really important ideas. We, we know that the project will benefit from three different sorts of benefits. All of them are public benefits. The first is the baseline requirements and mitigations. Things like enhanced sidewalks, bike lanes, green space, and many more that you're familiar with. And in this instance in particular, there'll be publicly valuable project features that Google will conduct uh, at their discretion. And then in addition, there'll be community benefits. Before we could talk more about community benefits with Google, we first had to go through an extensive and in-depth process, understanding what the elements of the project are and then determining how the city requirements would be fulfilled. As council stated from the beginning, Google is expected to comply with regular city requirements. For example, we clarified what the parks requirements are going to be. Affordable housing, parking, and, and transportation requirements, and many more. City costs can be delivered in many ways as mentioned. And so this is a careful process. And it also tells us how much it costs to pull together the uh, community, the, sorry, the infrastructure and the other mitigations that are required from normal baseline requirements. The project costs, including these city requirements and mitigations are integral. You have to know them to determine a project's financial feasibility. Next slide, please. We know from going through all the work that you've been seeing to, in this presentation, that even before we discuss community benefits, the project will bring substantial pu public benefits, 4,000 plus homes, commercial linkage fees, parks and open space, public art, deep sustainability toward climate smart goals, and up to 5,700 construction jobs, as well as publicly available parking that meets the city's obligation to the SAP Center. Next slide, please. These are just, once again, a statement of the 
types of requirements that we've been working on in order to fulfill the project obligations. Next slide. We also know that the MOU spoke to community benefit care uh, categories, and you see there are several here. Next slide, please. Council directed us to focus on three major community benefit areas. One, as we know, is affordable housing, stretching toward that 25% goal. The second, importantly, is displacement prevention and community stabilization so that we can make sure that we're not displacing people. And then education, training, and jobs. Next slide, please. Before we go further, it's an opportunity for us <clears throat> to share a little bit about what we've learned as we're moving through this process. The first thing to reflect on is that we know feasibility is incredibly important. We know that the downtown West presents a compelling opportunity for Google to develop world-class office space in a contiguous manner that is not available anywhere else, certainly not in the Bay Area. Still, we need to recognize that Google will not invest in San Jose if leasing or building space is not commercially viable. Feasibility must be a primary concern to ensure that the project gets built and that the community benefits are produced. Similarly, we re recognize that the production of residential housing is a public benefit in and of itself and that housing, particularly high rise housing is not at the moment profitable, but nonetheless, Google has expanded their plan to include a large amount of housing. In fact, 50% of their project is not office. And this was done by Google and the city in response to the city's housing production objectives. Some of the other insights that we're gaining from this is that in subsequent discussions with Google, city and staff will work to express the community benefits in terms of office square footage. This not only allows for comparison to other Silicon Valley agreements, but represents a major achievement by Google and the city to shift the burden of the city requirements and community benefits to the office space. Through the Google portion, Google project, a portion of parks, affordable housing, and other housing requirements will be produced by office construction, which should also assist with the ultimate uh, build out of the housing market rate units itself. This is all in addition to the provision of commercial linkage fees that will be paid by Google for housing production. Next slide, Pete. Now, we, would, we need to be able to tell you that this, this project is not a done deal. The project has risks that we need to work our way through in order to ensure that the project can be built. The first one I'm going to mention is on the far right, the Deardon Integrated Station Concept Plan. Recently, the Deardown Integrated Station Concept Plan partners indicated that they were maybe going to take additional land to accomplish the integrated station concept. There is concern that if too much land is taken, the project will not be able to yield the development capacity that is needed to produce a sufficient amount of community benefits. Google and the city have been very clear that if we can't accomplish a high quality project that brings with it proportionate community benefits, the project will not take place. The other next risk I want to share a little bit about is the downtown crane policy. In looking at this moment, at the time of the study session, the current allowance for crane heights is not sufficient and would inhibit the build out of the full heights of the downtown west project as designed. 
this could have the same type of impacts, limiting the development capacity, limiting the amount of community benefits and causing the pro project not to proceed. I do wanna emphasize that in both instances, the DISC partners, as well as the airport director himself and staff and consultants are working these problems assiduously and are very optimistic about finding solutions and a way through. I also wanna mention uh, more about the timing of the build out of the um, development capacity that is uh, slated for the Sharks and City ABC lot. The option agreement with Google links the city sharks and Google uh, tightly together. All parties essentially must agree on key issues in order for ABC to be developed as a key part of the station. The first issue identifies that when and if Google development can take place on ABC. The Sharks must be satisfied that the parking obligation and other obligations can be met in an alternative way. The Sharks are and will continue to be important to San Jose. If the Sharks aren't, aren't uh, able to uh, give their consent, then we can't sell the land until 2040-41, which the option and right of re first refusal agreement uh, goes to 2041 and development could take place after that time. Until that time though, not having the development will minimize the impact and quality of the station area, the integration of it from north to south, and it will impact the economics of the Google project, limiting what can be built in the near term and delay community benefits. Second, and importantly as well, we want to ensure that we can negotiate an extension of the SAP uh, arena agreement with the Sharks to extend beyond 2040. And to do that, um, that, that has to be recognized that Google has effective control of the property until 2040 or beyond. So these are significant risks, but again, a lot of optimism based on assiduous work being done by staff to work through them. Next slide. Anticipating that we will work through all of the elements and risks that we just told you about, the city is very excited that Google is moving forward, planning to deliver 25% affordable housing to meet that high bar goal, especially at this time with the downtown West project. It's very exciting. And in addition, the, in, in addition to the affordable housing proposals, we envision that the community benefits plan will include financial contributions to a fund or funds to support investment in community priorities related to community stabilization and opportunity pathways. What we mean by that through the community stabilization fund or area, we would serve homeless services, legal aid for those who are threatened with eviction, and the purchase of naturally affordable housing in the area to keep it affordable. These are just some of the types of activities that could be undertaken with those funds. In addition, targeting fund money to uh, opportunity pathways for activities like early childhood education, scholarships, internships, adult upskilling, and opportunities for small business and op, uh, entrepreneurship. Next slide, please. This is my last slide, you'll be happy to know. And we intend on moving through the conclusion of the DA negotiations, which will include finalizing business terms, the commitments on affordable housing and community benefits and that we'll finish related agreements, including parks, district utilities, infrastructure, and more. My apologies. Um, and that we'll present a recommended development agreement at the next SOG meeting, which is anticipated Q1 and prior to planning commission and, and then city council hearings in spring of 2021. 
And with that, I thank you very much for your time, your patience, and look forward to hearing comments from the council and public. Great, thank you, Nancy. And thank you everyone for their presentations. Uh, appreciate the enormous amount of work that's being done across the city organization with many stakeholders and, and key partners as well. Uh, particularly a lot of work being done in the community with many, many um, community meetings. And Lori, thank you for your work and leading that effort. Um, I uh, recognize we're gonna be pressed on time to get uh, all the, what needs to be said or wants to be said done between now and what is the scheduled time to conclude which is five o'clock we may go a bit over but what i wanted to implore my colleagues um and maybe this would be a recommended process for now is um let's see how much we can get done with regard to council questions and response between now and four o'clock and i would ask if all my comment all my colleagues could limit their comments to no more than 10 minutes because even doing that much would take more than sort of a proportionate amount of time. So that way we'd have enough time to at least have an hour of public comment after four o'clock uh, to be able to wrap things up. And so I'd ask my colleagues if you could uh, constrain uh, and, and uh, your questions and ask uh, the members of the staff who may be responding to also be sensitive to the time so that we can move things along. Um, and certainly make reference to documents where we can learn more information if that will save a very extensive discussion. So let's open it now to the council for questions. Uh, council member Davis. Thank you, Mayor. I, I'm sensitive to um, the complexities and risks and, and Nancy, your point about this uh, by no means being a done deal um, for the Google project to come downtown. So I think this is my main, my main question is really, what do we lose as a city if Google, if the Google project does not happen? Because it sounds like it's an all or nothing prospect. I can start on that. Um, as a response, it's an unparalleled project for the city. We heard um, Kim describe um, the role of Google as really a master developer at the core that sets the rest of the tone for the DSAP. So in terms of dollars, we believe the overall project will be uh, exceed probably $10 billion of investment construction projects or construction wages from the project and the 5,700 um, uh, construction workers anticipated will be probably at least a billion dollars in and of itself. So as an, a way to answer that, it's the cohesive development and a tremendous amount of investment uh, throughout San Jose. And staff really take seriously that there are many interests to satisfy and many uh, shared visions that we are working to weave together. Kim, did you have anything to add? Just obviously this area is very attractive and would be developed over time. Um, the alternative is a speculative developer that would come in and develop it for unknown future tenants or to flip it and sell it off in the future. It's extremely unusual and extremely valuable have an owner operator company like Google who's investing to be part of our community for the long run. So we would lose that, I think, very unique opportunity. Thank you. Do we have a dollar amount on what we think our city revenue, how our city revenue will change when there are office buildings on what is now a parking lot? We had a fiscal analysis that we presented in December of 2018, and we will be updating it. But su suffice it to say, it was in the tens of millions of dollars annually, and it was net fiscally uh, positive. And that's just for the city, tens of millions of dollars, just for the city government. Correct. Um, the, the school district obviously is would be strongly supported as well as the county. Great, thank you. 
Um, and then I did want to ask um, Jessica Zank, can you go into a little more detail about the parking and transportation management? I think it was slide 48. Um, and I understand about the parking as a shared resource. I think many of us, I think all of us received the email from the sharks and their concern about parking and about um, traffic flow. Can you talk a little bit more about that, Jessica, and kind of what work is being done around that um, on that topic? Sure, absolutely. Jessica Zank, Deputy Director for the Department of Transportation. So I don't um, have control of the slides, but I imagine uh, you're correct on the slide number. And if um, the clerk wanted to put that up, that would be great. Um, but I can speak to it in the meantime, which is that we really um, value the partnership with the SAP Center and take our obligations under the Arena Management Agreement very seriously. And that's a key driver behind the proposed district approach to manage the public parking and uh, the transportation demand management solutions very comprehensively. We think it's extremely important that that commercial parking be available um, to people who are attending SAP Center events, as well as people who might want to um, access the transit center by vehicle, um, as well as people who are going to their job or going shopping in the area, et cetera. The, the district approach is novel for the city. It would combine a comprehensive parking benefits district with a transportation management association because we've, we've looked and studied the best practices within parking and uh, transportation management and seen that they're best coordinated together because that lets the, the comprehensive view um, uh, of how the system is working, both how you get to the place, the transportation side and the parking side together. So this is the overarching framework proposed and then you'll recall that the Downtown West project is very much um, keeping in line with this. Um, the work that the city, Google and the Sharks have been doing has been um, very careful to make sure that sufficient parking is there for the SAP Center, um, both at the end of the day and over time. So there's a lot of work to understand that, that phasing and then how access and egress from the parking um, is available. So in the name of brevity, I will stop there, um, but uh, definitely lots of ongoing work to be done as well. And can you talk just one more question, sure. Jessica, and then I will let my comment, uh, I'll finish my comments, but the airport connector, how does that fit into the transportation management? That's a, a great question. So the airport connector, um, folks may recall, I think two slides before, is one of the key access uh, points planned for the Deardon integrated station concept. Ooh, one more. There we go. Thank you. It's in the, the red uh, symbol there. So this is a direct efficient connection between Deardon Station and the airport. Uh, it enables a few things. Number one, people arriving to the station uh, to San Jose from high speed rail. San Jose International would be the first airport that they hit along their route. So being able to transfer to the connector um, is one of the, the critical pieces of making San Jose International Airport a really um, uh, complementary uh, effort to the high-speed rail station here. Um, you'll recall that in August, we brought an update about the request for information that the city led working with VTA and others to advance this airport connector project. And that work continues um, with VTA as well as the other cities um, involved further along the Stevens Creek line. Thank you. And I just wanna um, thank all of the staff. It is quite a large team that has been working on all these various pieces to, um, to put together a vision for for this expanded area of our downtown and I'm sure many well all of the staff and, and many people watching know that that a large portion of this is in district six my district and I'm I am so grateful and so much of the feedback that that I have received from district six residents is extreme 
extremely supportive. And, and I will say the Deer Down Area Neighborhood Group has been, um, has had many, many good things to say about all the staff and the extra time that they have spent, um, that you all have spent with them explaining and, and going through and getting their input and feedback. And um, I just think this, the project has continued to evolve and improve over time. And, and I am very grateful. I wanna thank each and every one of you for all of your work that you are continuing to do. I know there are still, as Nancy uh, pointed out, still a lot of work and analysis to be done. And I am excited to see the developments over time. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Well deserved praise. Uh, so we'll go from one council member who represents part of the area to the other, and that's council member Ralph Perella. Yeah, thank you, mayor. Um, and yeah, this certainly, um, as Deb just said, a, a very impactful project uh, with a lot of anticipated uh, community members from district six and district three, but certainly as we know, um, since this project was first unveiled or the opportunity, I should say, uh, it has generated not only citywide, but really regional significance. And so it's not just uh, my my community members I know that are, that are interested or, or, or Council Member Davis is, uh, but indeed with us representing the most uh, immediate neighbors uh, and the ones that will uh, sort of, you know, be impacted the most and, and those uh, that, that quite frankly have participated with us through many iterations of uh, what, what has been planned here, as staff pointed out in their, their presentation, um, the, the hopes and dreams of a ballpark, um, but the reality is just the hopes and dreams of, of an area and an underdeveloped area uh, and being able to, to really develop it into an entire new community with uh, the, hopefully the, the, all the elements that we would wanna see in uh, a, a, a city such as, as ours, one that does incorporate the job growth around transit that we know we, we've been eager to have. Uh, and certainly uh, the affordable housing as we know that that's risen to the top of not only our community concerns, but, but of our concerns. And, um, and so I, I also wanna thank staff for uh, your uh, diligence in this and, uh, patience and and really for getting us through uh, and to this point and uh, it was a very thorough presentation uh, for today and, and hopefully and I, I believe we have a lot of community members that are that are interested so hopefully we do get an opportunity to hear from our community members here today uh, as as was pointed out there's been a lot of community engagement but uh, we have not had uh, too many opportunities where it's the full council being able to to, to, to receive a presentation like this and get some feedback. And so I think this is a, a great opportunity before we make some, some major decisions. I just have a, a focus on, on a couple areas and I think Councilor Davis pointed out in regards to the fact that this is not somehow a done deal. Uh, I think you know it's kind of felt like that maybe for many as we've moved along because there have been some major milestone decisions, certainly Google coming in and purchasing the property but to assume that, that we're going to get the, the development that we've all been yearning for um, and that that's somehow a done deal, I think, uh, was highlighted um, in today and, and, and a very important aspect of it in regards to uh, there are, are still hurdles. Uh, we certainly saw, and Councilor Davis pointed it out, in regards to the sharks and, and just uh, one of the major community partners that we have in the area, um, sort of the have been the destination for for this this area uh, around Deardon Station for a, a quarter century, and so uh, a, a partner that we want to be able to work with. Um, at, the, at the same time, um, I think certainly my interest is that we continue to to grow in in a way that uh, does not cater around the vehicle, and I think that that uh, obviously you know brings a lot of anxiety to our partners at the sh at the Sharks. Uh, just given the nature of, of how they've they've run their business for for these these years, and so uh, I think that was was addressed. I, I think we'll we'll have to continue to kind of to, to dive maybe further into that. Um, but I wanted to touch just overall in regards to some of the 
the challenges we may see, um, some of the, the development opportunities. I know that around the, the Deerdon station itself, how flexible is the, the sort of the, the, these, these different segments of the project? We have areas uh, sort of now being designated uh, for open space, um, both public and private open space. And we have areas designated for housing and um, areas designated for office. As, as we move through, and if there are, say, some challenges with, with some of these properties and parcels, and um, how, how flexible is the actual kind of project here, how flexible, how flexible not only, I guess, are we, but also Google in, in being able to kind of overcome some of these challenges and still achieve uh, a project, still achieve not only just a project, you know, but, but the, the same mixed use um, kind of overall breadth of this project that we all want to see with all of these different elements, um, given that the, the, the challenges may force us to kind of to make some tougher decisions or, or maybe to have some trade-offs. So how possible is that? What, how likely um, is that? And, and how, or I should say, how flexible? So let me just start off and then ask Rosalind to comment as well, that um, part of the great part about the project is that it comes with more jobs and more housing and the housing is very important. Within the areas, we'll turn to Roseland, there, there is flexibility. Um, as we all see through the downtown core designation, for example, there's some level of flexibility. Uh, the point is we, we have to achieve a, a minimum amount of development capacity uh, before we erode to a point where the project couldn't proceed. But Roseland, do you wanna comment about flexibility? Yes, thanks, Nancy. Uh, so to your point, um, there is a certain amount of flexibility already built into the Downtown West Development Project, as well as the amended DSAP. And as Nancy referenced, the downtown land use designation that we currently have in our general plan actually allows um, both um, office or residential uses or a combination of both. So with that land use designation that um, is actually um, being used in downtown West proposal, as well as the amended DSAP, we are actually already building in a certain amount of flexibility um, as, as we're currently reviewing the work. And Rosalind, is it fair to say that all fits in within the existing uh, general plan and zonings. Over time, it's also, if needed to make further changes, then there could be future times that would require coming back to council. Certainly, at, at any time, we could come back to council if what is now or in the future being proposed does not fit into a particular land use designation. We definitely have that opportunity. Um, but again, I do want to highlight that there is a good amount of land that uh, we are proposing for that downtown land use designation, which currently um, does allow both office and residential. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just, I think, you know, with, with certainly uh, a number of factors and variables still yet to be determined, um, I, I, I want to be able to see a project through, and, and it'd be great to see this project through that we're sort of describing now, um, the different elements, but without really having all the variables in place, uh, I, I just want to ensure that, that, that there's flexibility uh, and not only on, on our part, but again, as I said, on hopefully our, our partner is it's Google, where we, we don't end up in a place where we, we, we don't have a project. I think that doesn't benefit any of us, doesn't benefit us as a city, our community certainly doesn't benefit Google and all the time and energy they've put in, uh, and every other uh, really investor and in, in, in property owner um, and those that are interested in the area here. Uh, it is it is to everybody's benefit that we build a, a, a real world world class area around this station in uh, downtown West, and um, certainly that's 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 what I'm hoping for. I know that's what we're all moving towards. Um, I, I will leave it at that with my uh, overall questions and interested in what our our community has to say and, and uh, my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, Councilmember Jimenez. Thank you, Mayor. I just uh, have a few questions. As you all know, that uh, we we often have a chance to 
poke around, kick the tires and ask questions outside of these spaces. So I'll, I'll just be very brief. Um, this is for staff. I'm not sure who wants to take this on, but as you all know, uh, neighborhood groups reach out to all of us, even if we don't represent the area near the station. And so I know there's been a neighborhood group, the Deer Dawn Area Neighborhood Group, Dang, which is a cool name, I think, uh, they, they presented <laughs> you know, a list of concerns and such. And, and I know, uh, I think some of it's related to some of the buildings as it sort of progresses and as the development progresses into the neighborhood. And so I was hoping someone can touch on some of those concerns and whether we feel like we're adequately addressing those. Yeah, we, yeah. yeah, we've all um, um, have, have had many meetings with the Dang Group, but let me ask Rosalind in, in particular, since I think the core concerns relate to planning. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, Council Member. Yes, we have been um, meeting with the members of the Dang for several months now. Um, and actually, we have made some changes to the proposed um, height di diagram. Um, to respond to their concerns, particularly about um, adjacencies to existing um, low density residential neighborhoods. So we under totally understand the concern about height um, and density um, next to those existing areas. Um, and we've been sharing with them um, throughout the process that you know, as we work on this, there's going to be a series of, of trade-offs. Um, and again, um, the proposed densities that we currently have in the amended DSAP, these are maximum levels so that we're able to clear this certain amount of development capacity through the environmental process. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, as different development projects come in, um, they'll be reviewed, um, you know, based on variety of, of items, including those design standards um, and guidelines. And uh, if we do have a moment, uh, Tim, I, I just ask if you have any further details to, to um, add to that in terms of how we've addressed concerns from the day. I think you covered it pretty well, Rosalind. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. And, and let me, let me just, just clarify that the, the concerns in the areas where the, with the heights are for the DSAP, not, not for the Google Downtown Rust project specifically. Okay, yeah, and that's, to be very honest with you, as I mentioned during the meeting, I think we had Friday, that uh, that, that I know that uh, obviously there's a lot going on in this area, and so I, I would say for, I suspect maybe some council members that don't touch this topic uh, as often as maybe Council Member Davis or Peral is that uh, there's just a lot going on and trying to parse out what's what and <laughs> what's applicable to the Google, you know, the Google development as it relates to the broader DSAP area. I think creates uh, confusion for me at times and I'm sure confusion for our residents. And so thank you for that. Um, the other thing I'll just mention, and I mentioned it during our Friday meeting is just the design guidelines. Uh, and, I, and I think I got a, it seems like I felt satisfied with the answer from Google, but uh, the thought was that, you know, we, we have these design guidelines and we have this, these, um, the, these um, you know, the design of how the project is going to take place. And, and what we found at least as it relates to South San Jose, the Village Oaks Shopping Center, that was uh, put forward to folks that it was gonna be a, a Santana Row of sorts. Um, and in the end, it, it actually didn't look anything like that. <laughs> and even to the present day, I hear complaints about that. And so uh, I'd really uh, love uh, that as this develops and, and some of those design guidelines put, get put out there and, and some of the uh, design work is put out to the community that we try to get it to look like that as much as possible and not have something totally different. Uh, thank you for that. The other, the other question I had is related to some stuff I've been hearing related to the discounting of park fees. And I know Nicole, you're on the call. I'm not sure who else from the parks department on the call. Um, is it, because I've heard a little bit of, from, from uh, both sides, some folks have said, that it seems like uh, in this area and part of downtown, not specific to Google, obviously, but uh, uh, that there's going to be an, uh, some discounting of park fees. Is that, or maybe there's something already in place? We've passed so many policies that I, I can't always remember what the heck's in place and what is it. But if you can help uh, me better understand that. Sure, I, I can take that for you. Um, and, and in short, there is no plan to. to discount park fees specifically for downtown west or for the Deeradon area. I think there, I agree with you, there has been some recent confusion over that. What you will see come forward in the next, within the next couple of months, probably in January, 
is an amendment to our park fee program so that we are in line with the inclusionary housing ordinance that was recently passed. So we need to do some cleanup work there. And that would, um, the, the proposed plan is um, to get us in line with inclusionary housing. We would offer some opportunity, limited opportunity for um, units that come in at 100% of the area median income or 100% AMI um, to receive the 50% reduction in park fee but that is only if they are part of the inclusionary housing ordinance and it would only be 5% of the total affordable units proposed in any one development. So it's a, it's a very small window that opens up. And again, it really is about keeping us in line with that, with the updated housing policy. Okay, all right, thank you. I, and the reason I mentioned that is I just fear that uh, we're gonna go down a road and I know, you know we, we've discounted fees and such uh, in an effort to spur development and, and made things a little bit more cost effective or pencil out for developers and such. But I, I don't desire to have a, a community or a city where we don't have the resources to build out park space for folks, for the folks we're actually building houses for to be able to recreate. So I think it's a fine balance. And so I, I think it's something to always keep in mind as we're going through these, these developments and, and these projects. The other question I had, uh, and I don't I don't recall if on Friday I had a meeting with uh, some of the, the staff in the city and from Google. So I don't recall if anyone from Parks is on there, but uh, I, I wanted to just highlight something that I mentioned and that is in relation to some of the turnkey parks that Google hopefully will eventually be building out and essentially handing over to the city. Um, and and um, I forget, I don't have all the documents in front of me, but uh, there are, I, I think a few, and if I'm incorrect, please correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, the question I had is re related to maintenance agreements. And, and, and so once those are built out, turned over to the city, who, who's going to be charged with maintaining those? And I, I think I recall that uh, it was essentially going to be the city's responsibility. Is that your understanding, Nicole? That is the current intent, but there is um, some discussion that we're having with Google about um, how we might modify that. Right, ways that we could work together to establish a conservancy or an alternative um, method for managing those parks. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, it's a complicated nut to crack for a variety of reasons and we're working through it. I don't know that we'll have an answer you know, within the next six months, but it is something we're, we're committed to, to looking at and continuing to work through. Okay, very good. And then the other thing as it relates to parks, you know, obviously Google's gonna have a lot of employees in the area, which is, I think is great. It's gonna add vibrancy, a lot of, uh, foot traffic to a lot of the businesses downtown, including downtown West. But uh, what I get concerned about is that some of these, uh, I'll put in quotations, public spaces that are being built out or will hopefully be built out as it relates to the Google development, that, uh, that they're in effect going to be turned into private spaces uh, dominated by Google employees. And so uh, I'm curious as to what what are we going to put in place to make certain that if a family and a neighbor from some of the housing there or from the local neighborhood wants to go recreate on some of that parkland that, or, or that green space uh, that's public, uh, that they're going to be able to do so without feeling like it's not really public. Because I know we've had instances uh, around the city where there's public space, but it's, it, it essentially turns into a de facto private space, just maybe the way it's oriented or the you know, folks around there. And so I'd be curious as to your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a it's definitely a topic that is on my mind a lot, um, and it's a topic on which we've had a number of conversations with Google. Um, there will be, we expect to establish a series of rules, um, requirements, kind of the operating parameters of each of those spaces, and we'll have a clear understanding of of how and when and they'll exactly the circumstances under which they will be publicly accessible. Like I said in my presentation, we do expect that they will be, they'll, they will look and feel like public parks. Um, that is our expectation. Um, but I think as the project moves forward, you'll see more detail on that. Okay. I just wanted you. to add in something, council member, that, mm -hmm. um, and, and Nicole, please correct me, but just as a distinction in case people, folks miss this, on the parks the, that will remain with Google, Google will maintain those parks. Mm -hmm. the parks that get dedicated to the city, it's the city standard practice that after a period of time, the city does take over that maintenance. So it's, it's consistent with the, the city practice and like Nicole said, other opportunities being envisioned. Right, okay. Yeah, thank you for that uh, clarity, uh, Nancy. The other question I had is just related to this whole presentation. Obviously, 
we're getting an update as to where things are currently, right? Uh, they're going to continue to evolve and progress, I hope. Um, and so with that in mind, uh, I, I know, uh, Kim, I, I didn't have a chance to talk to you before the meeting, but I, I know you reached out saying, you know, if I had any questions, but related to the incentive zoning program. Um, so based on, you know, I think it was the four page sort of HRA uh, consultants, I, I guess I'll, I'll call them for lack of a better word, provided uh, essentially some information related to the incentive zoning program or the possibility of one. Uh, given what they've uh, sort of uh, concluded, um, and given that this is an update to, to let us know where things are, what is what happens to this idea now based on just in, in your mind as it relates to incentive zoning moving forward? Um, yeah. Yeah, so th thank you, Council Member. And, and we think it was really valuable to explore. Um, and I think you can probably see staff will not be recommending to Council an incentive zoning program, right, as part of the amended Deer Don Station area plan. And the, and the reason is um, that we can capture more value with more certainty through these existing tools that we now have put in place, including the commercial linkage fee. Right. And I know we were inspired by Seattle, but what we became clear was that Seattle only had incentive zoning in as a temporary optional program that didn't perform very well until like 10 years later, they put their impact fee programs in place for mm -hmm. affordable housing. So yeah, so I'm just giving you a preview mm -hmm. that um, just based on the analysis, we we will don't will not be recommending that it get put in place. So, so is it talk about it further? Yeah. Okay, so is this is this safe to say that it essentially dies with this four page report? And, and <laughs> I mean that's up to council. I, I'm yeah I'm trying to say we we were directed to do the analysis right. and to come back with the analysis prior to bringing our. Um, final recommendations forward. So if okay. we need to do that more formally by bringing it to council for an action meeting, we can talk about that. But um, we're bringing, we're bringing, sharing our analysis with you. And we just think there's other ways that would be more reliable and um, capture more value to accomplish what we think your objective is. Yeah, well, well, I guess, you know, one of the things as it relates to incentive zoning, I guess I was I was thinking when when we put the memo out some time back, and, and unfortunately I had I didn't have a chance to review the memo before this meeting. But um, part of the interest for me was that incentive zoning and the benefits derived from that seem to be more flexible. So it wouldn't necessarily or only be for housing. It could be, it could be for park amenities. It can be for X, Y, and Z, right? And I feel like this, this four page report was sort of tailored to the idea that maybe we were only thinking about using those benefits for housing, but that, I guess that wasn't necessarily my orientation specifically. I'll give you an example. I mean, I was made aware of, I think uh, Mountain View is gonna be approving something, I think it's tomorrow or so, in which uh, they have a similar, not exactly, but some they have incentive zoning and some of the benefits that have been derived from that, for example, what they're doing in this development they're gonna be approving is that it's a housing development and it's, uh, they're gonna be condominiums, but some of the benefits in this fund are gonna be used to help folks, uh, low income folks maybe, or folks with uh, less means uh, when they go in and purchase one of these condos, pay down or, or pay some of the HOA fees, for example. That's what they plan to use some of this money for. And so that flexibility was appealing to me because I, I think based on everything as it relates to the commercial linkage fee or, or other type of fees that we have, even the discount and construction fees and things of, like that we've done around the city and downtown specifically, um, it seemed to me that, that the need continue to exist for those, you know, those developments are gonna have an impact and those impacts continue to exist. And so in my mind was, the idea of incentive zoning, I thought would be one tool to help fill backfill some of that stuff. And maybe, you know, I, I know many of you on here are much smarter than as it relates to this, uh, but that was just the thinking behind it. And so my point is this, is that I would hate for, for, for incentive zoning and the idea to, to, to die a very sad death in this update as it relates to, to, to what's happening around Google and Deer Dawn Station. I, I, I'd love to 
learn a bit more about it and, 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 you know, better understand the nuances and we can do it offline certainly, but I hope yeah. this is the last time that we touch this or consider. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, council member. Yeah, we do understand it can be used um, more broadly and because it's important, we do have our two consultants here who are very experienced with this and let, let me ask them just to chime in, uh, Thomas and or AP. Yeah. So um, I think, you know, Thomas has, um, can sort of bring a little bit of the analytic perspective and I'll bring a little bit of developer perspective here um, because in Seattle, as Kim mentioned, so my, a lot of my career has been in Seattle. Um, um, we had an uh, incentive zoning program here, um, which was later supplanted by an inclusionary zoning program. And the, the reality here is that from a policy perspective, you can use additional dollars to do whatever you want, right? Um, both uh, incentive zoning and uh, inclusionary zoning are a little bit of a tax on development, which, which is, sort of the, is sort of how they work. Um, and one of them, if you have incentive zoning, um, sometimes people say, mm, I don't really want that extra space at that price. And then that can cause people to build a little bit shorter, which is maybe somewhat in conflict with some of the objectives for downtown. If you have something more like inclusionary zoning where a developer pays a fee for every square foot that they build, you have a much more transparent relationship between the tax and the amount of development. The more you increase it, the less development you'll have over time. It's not like an on off switch. It's more of like a how, you know, it's like a break on a car, right? You can you can tap it, it you know, with your foot with a different strength. Um, but then you can use those proceeds to build housing and you can also potentially, or a later council could decide to use, you know, if, if the demand for development goes up in San Jose, you could increase the fee and use some of that money for something else. And so um, I guess I just wanted to clarify that having two mechanisms doesn't necessarily allow you to unlock more money than if you just have one mechanism. But if you have one mechanism that works well and that charges a fee on every square foot of development, you can then sort of administer that in a very straightforward way. And hopefully that's yeah. helpful. And I'll yeah. pass it to Thomas because he probably has something if to I can ask this. you a question, AP, just before I lose my train of thought. But but that's specific to housing, right? I mean, that's not that that stream of income it wouldn't be as flexible as it really as compared to incentive zoning, correct? Or, or may, maybe I'm not understanding. Thomas, did you want to add anything? So, yeah, well, so I think that there's two aspects to this. On one hand, on the residential side, because of the challenges of the development market in San Jose, there's no value to be captured from residential at the moment. Mm -hmm. On the commercial side, um, the commercial linkage fee obviously is focused on um, the production of affordable housing and capturing value from office space. But in developing our memo, we also consider the Deardon Station um, infrastructure fee as a key funding tool for a wider range of community benefits, um, obviously including infrastructure itself, but parks as well as community facilities um, and being able to extract value from office um, for a directed set of, of priorities. Just a consideration on incentive zoning programs, which council member, as you say, offer flexibility in the provision of a range of community benefits. Mm -hmm. Typically, what we find is that that flexibility is offered to the developers in the form of sort of a menu of options. And a challenge that a number of municipalities have found is that it's very hard to keep the sort of the value of those options calibrated. So in, in many cases where you have, for example, you know, recreation, transportation, housing, or other sort of options to provide in exchange for additional capacity, mm -hmm. you end up producing sort of one of those options that's the least expensive for developers which is also the advantage of a fee program where there's more flexibility for council to council or staff to provide a sort of specific direction and allocation of where those funds go. Okay, all right. Well, well listen, I, I, I thank you for, for the report. In addition to, 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 the, to the memo that you all submitted, uh, Thomas and AP, is there, uh, would you be willing, and maybe I apologize if it was in the, the, a lot of the information that was provided as it relates to the study session, but if we can, if there's any additional information that we don't have our hands on, and if we can get that, that'd be great if you're open to sharing that. Kim? Yeah, I, we'd be, yeah, we'd be happy to meet offline with you with AP and Thomas and to share that analysis in more depth. 
Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, thank you. And so I just want to say one last thing. It's not a question. It's just, uh, you, you know, I, I can appreciate the fact that um, that uh, Google coming is not a done deal and there may be some some impediments maybe or, or some challenges or risks that, that may put it uh, in jeopardy. Um, and I appreciate that. But I, I have... I have difficulty dealing with uh, just with, sometimes with with the with the language that's used as as almost as if um, Google's doing us a favor and we need to walk carefully and tread carefully. <laughs> uh, I take issue with that sort of sentiment, uh, and I would say is uh, the way I view this development. I think it's a good thing. I think we all voted for it. It was a unanimous vote. Uh, I think I said at the time that uh, I was cautiously optimistic that everything would come forward as was presented back in the day. Um, it seems to me moving forward. I know this is not a done deal, but I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that uh, as a city that this is mutually beneficial, right? It's beneficial for Google. It's also beneficial for us. And so I, I don't, I, I just cringe when I sense that we're, we're, we as a city in some minds, right? And you hear it often that we're selling ourselves short, right? And, and I, I think that, uh, you know, we, I don't want to make things more difficult for Google, but you know, we, we should expect nothing but the best from them. We should, and it seems like we've been getting that, it seems to me, right? They, they constant communication and, and such. And so uh, I just- sorry, Matt, I, I'm sorry to butt in, but we're now yeah. well past the 20 minute mark and we had asked everyone to show some restraint here at 10 minutes. Right. Is there a question that's imperative because we, we've got other members and the, the public to, to hear from. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, that, that was it. I actually didn't see the little clock in the, yeah. So thank you, appreciate it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Foley. Thank you, Mayor. First, I'd like to thank uh, Kim and all of the staff members who were involved in this really detailed project. This is really comp complicated, a lot of moving pieces, and I am, uh, since I wasn't here in, in 2018 to approve the MOU or authorize it moving forward, it's I have been playing catch up over the last uh, year and a half or so, and to hear have this study session is extremely helpful for me to hear where we're going and uh, and some of the concerns. So I I do have um, I I appreciate all that will come with this project both the Deardon station improvements, which are critical, and also the Im increased employment centers and housing and community benefits program or projects. But I have some questions and they're mostly for you, Nancy, as they relate to the development agreement and the risks involved. I'm mindful of the construction that will be involved in the scope of Deardon Station, the Google projects and all of that. Is it the plan that there will be a master plan to deal with the construction? And is that part of the development agreement? Or, and at what point will we see that plan and how is that being negotiated or will that be negotiated with the partners? Council member, thank you very much for the question. The city is committed to a very constructive construction management plan, and Dave may want to speak to this at the end of comments, given his prior role as the uh, director of public works. We will do as we have done in the past. Some folks may remember we had a very intensive downtown set of development and transit development. And, and for example, there was a single point of contact uh, that guided many people that happened to be Matt Kano at that period of time, um, but it was a, a, a very smart person taken to, to making sure that the job was done well. We will work to make sure, particularly for the Sharks, but for all development, that we address people getting in and out of their places of business or in and out of the, of the SAP center. So we need some more information. What's being constructed when? Uh, we don't have that, but we are certainly committed to doing a great job with that. Dave, I don't know if there's a, anything you wanted to add. No, I think you. I think you covered it well, Nancy. Obviously, it's work that is in our future, uh, but important work nonetheless. 
So in that plan will be, uh, you mentioned uh, the sharks and SAP center and, and all of that. And that's one area that I'm concerned with. I'm also concerned with the disruption to businesses during the time. I remember when the light rail was coming through and uh, other opportunities downtown that affected small businesses dramatically. So will, uh, are you, um, mindful, I'm, I'm sure you're mindful of that, but how will you be working with the, the small businesses in particular to help uh, diminish any effects on their displacement and their uh, lack of access to their businesses? Thank you for the question. There will be a number of conversations and commitments to plan. Um, Google, I believe in their development plans will commit to a construction mitigation program that's called a CHIMP. And then you will see that from the other, for example, the transit agencies, we've been already engaged in support in a conversation with VTA uh, on, 20, on 28th Street and Allen Rock in downtown on collaboration and support for small businesses. That will be also a similar conversation with the other transit agencies. And there will be work to support the businesses with uh, resources and um, guidance about how to make the most of what they've, they've been afforded. Uh, and then the new opportunities that come just on the other side of construction. Okay, thank you. Um, you had mentioned three risks and I don't know if this is the time or place to discuss them, but are any of these deal breakers? Well, again, I, I, I do think it's fair to say, because um, I'm, I'm very much keeping Councilmember Jimenez's thoughts in mind. Um, we, we are not going easy on Google. I think Google would tell you, tell you that. And at the same time, um, there are deal breakers here. There are, that if we don't, the, the, the issue is capacity. If you had a whole lot of space come out of DISC, which again, people are working toward solution. And if a whole lot couldn't be built because you couldn't get the cranes high enough to build the, the design, you could envision uh, a moment where uh, there's not enough capacity to do it right and then it wouldn't get done. What exactly is that? I don't know that we're prepared to say that today, but it, the issues raised are important to keep in mind and continue working through. Nancy, can I just chime in here a little bit um, with a parallel from South Lake Union and in Seattle? So in Seattle, we had a development area called South Lake Union, which you've probably heard a little bit about where it was a formerly industrial area where Amazon has had a lot of growth and um, it was subject to a rezone about a decade ago. And the, what really pushed that neighborhood to transition was that Paul Allen, who was Bill Gates's co-founder at Microsoft, invested a lot in the development of that neighborhood. And it's quite difficult to be a developer and be the first mover in a neighborhood because the first building you build is still in a formerly industrial neighborhood. So there's a little bit of a dynamic thing going on where once the whole neighborhood is built out, it becomes more valuable. And so I think um, there is a sense where having an entity that will commit to a very significant development program over time and that is willing to invest in the early buildings and then be around later to participate in the kind of upswing of the neighborhood and reinvestment in community benefits, among other things, that there's a value to that that's not to say that nobody else could do it, but that when I've seen that done successfully in cities, it's usually because someone has a, a big significant ability to develop at scale, if that's helpful. I, I appreciate that AP, but in the meantime, there's going to be a lot of disruption. So as a council member, I consider what the disrupt, disruption costs will be to the neighbors, to the community, to the residents who live down there, including the businesses, including the sharks and other organizations. So I appreciate your, your comments. This also is not a, a warehouse area. It's a residential area where people and businesses will be displaced. It, there's no doubt about it. it. But And because of the very scope of, of the project, both projects, 
there will be disruption. The question for me is how will the disruption be mitigated over time? That's that's the question and I know that will be coming forward. So I appreciate all of this. I'm going to uh, conclude my comments and again, thanks staff. I haven't lived with this for a very long time and unlike council member Perales and Davis, who this is in their districts and they uh, are uh, very aware of this information and the neighbors communicate with them on a regular basis. I am uh, just starting, not just starting because I've been li living with it and understanding it for two years, but all of this information is helpful for me. With that, I will yield my minute and a half. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Camus. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and I appreciate the, the all the work that staff's been doing over the years. Um, I think um, myself and and uh, the mayor have been here the longest, and I could tell you that at one point in uh, in the past, when at least when I first came in, we were dying to get a company, any company, to come to the city of San Jose. And so, uh, you know, companies do have choices on where to locate, and um, and and I'm glad they they've chosen San Jose because they recognized uh, the wealth of of talent and all the amenities and the public transportation. And I, you know, and I know that they're committed to this because I've been talking to them for many many years. So, uh, you know, and 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 I'm sadly I wish this was going faster because I I'm out of office and I can't vote on this, uh, uh, even if it does go fa you know, faster than, than it's currently going. Um, I, I, and I also wanna, besides the staff, which I think is doing a phenomenal job, I wanna thank uh, Google. I mean, <laughs> there is no company that's ever been subjected to this kind of scrutiny ever in the history of San Jose, never. Uh, I've never seen a single project have a hundred side meetings, uh, have its own commission called SAG, have uh, you know all these public um, um, benefits, um, you know, being de demanded upon it. And I've seen lots of companies come in, like Adobe and and Samsung, and uh, where where we have experienced the opposite, <laughs> where companies were asking us for discounts and and tax uh, incentives and in lands or what have you. So I, I, I wanna be clear, um, I love having uh, a company that's willing to work with our community. Um, it's, it's a breath of fresh air. Um, they, they didn't come in here and try to beat us up on, on things and that's different. And, and, I, and, and I want people to know that because I have had the experience of being here quite some time and you know, this is not the normal process companies go through. And I want the public to know that. This is not something that a company goes through um, when trying to set up uh, offices in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a city, quite the opposite. I think a lot of cities, um, <laughs> they, they bend over backwards to get companies, giving them tax incentives and whatnot. So anyway, I really don't have much of a comment except for, for, uh, thank you, Kim and Nancy and, and Rosalind and all your staffs. And uh, I really hope that this project goes through for the sake of the city, the health of the economy and, and the job creation that will, the job and tax revenues and all the things that I think will be coming uh, if this becomes a reality. Thank you. Council Member Gibb? Yes, just very quickly. Um, I, I just wanted to underscore some of the points uh, made by, by staff that I think uh, might be not, might be lost in the public um, because you know staff went by them really fast. But I think they're important points to keep in mind. Uh, using North San Jose as an example, you know we we've had a vision for North San Jose. We've had a four phase plan, and we've tried to develop some things. Uh, we all know that the housing went quickly, but we're still waiting on a lot of retail, commercial, and so forth. Um, but that's not to say that nothing happened in North San Jose. What, what we did see was. Uh, maybe like redevelopment, using old buildings and, and, and just kind of upgrading the fixtures and not, but not a whole lot of new development. Uh, so I, I think one thing that I took out of this presentation is that uh, in terms of office space, in terms of just finding a place for workers to be, uh, one option for Google is, is simply uh, to just rent some of the empty vacant office buildings downtown. 
and and they're not doing that. They they choose to have a vision, and they choose to make San Jose part of that vision. And 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 because of that, um, they're they're building not a campus, but they're they're going through the city and they're building and including open space, uh, green space. Uh, retail and community space in addition to the places for for their employees to work and, and I think that's significant um, in terms of a, a bottom line or, or uh, you know profit margins just having a place to work and paying rent on it uh, is the more um, less visionary but more practical sense in terms of money and and uh, heading into difficult financial times can can we you know Nancy or Kim or, or Rosa anybody care to comment on that a bit Yeah. Okay, you are right, and we we did, Council Member. Thank you for that point. And um, AP or Thomas may want to add in there, but uh, it, it is less expensive to go into existing buildings. And to speak to value, Google understands the value of being by Deardon and the value of creating a very urban environment. So. Um, we we um, look forward to getting this done, but but very much appreciate your um, recognizing, Council Member, that there there are other technically less expensive ways to accomplish this. But the goal of bringing the vision to life and creating the whole greater than the parts is what Google and the rest of us are after. And thank you, Nancy. I mean, and the second thing I I'll, the last second and last thing I want to say is. Google solves a problem for us that, that I think Kim mentioned when she was speaking. It might have been Kim or somebody else, but in terms of assembling the land together, uh, we as a council, when we agreed to sell land to, to Google, we sold some city of San Jose land, but the rest of it was redevelopment land that, that we were holding in place. And it, it wasn't just, you know, um, even if we held it, we try to do something with it. We as a council did not have uh, we could only control San Jose land and we couldn't even build or control or master plan the redevelopment land agency land uh, and and there were other parcels around there from the county and and you know private residences private companies uh, that only somebody like Google or, or on Google's level could go in and assemble to a, a master palette where you could really start doing things like if you were playing Sim City and and saying we want a park here and, and a train station here and whatever else here because when we're doing land use, and this is something I've, I've understood, you know, learning from Rosalind in the last four years, um, is that we're, we're limited to what we own, right? And, and as a, a citizen, you think, oh, the city council is a government, they can do what they want. Uh, but that's simply not true. Uh, we are very constrained by, by CEQA and by private property rights and uh, the limits of, of our, our public dollars and our resources and what we own. But at the end of the day, we can only develop what we own. And we didn't own a whole lot down there. Uh, Google came in and now there's a, one large parcel, an assemblage where you could really do something wonderful. And so um, again, I, I think that that bears pointing out um, because it's not like, oh, if Google didn't come in, we can have an alternative plan to do something else equally great or but it would be city owned or publicly owned. That's, that's simply not the case. Uh, so I, I just wanna leave that there and, and thank you. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. When redevelopment went away, we had to invent entirely new models of how to advance our city. And it was very important, though, that council said no subsidies, no incentives, fair market value. And, and it worked that way. It's great. Puts us in the position we're in now to have a cohesive master plan implementation of our community's vision. Yeah, that's it. I'll yield there. Thank you, Council Member. Um, any last comments? I had a brief remarks to make, but I just want to make sure my colleagues have all had an opportunity to answer, ask questions. I know we're all asking lots of questions and staff uh, throughout throughout the day and throughout the week. So I know this is far from our only opportunity. So we'll, we'll go to the public now then. I, I, I want to uh, thank again all staff for all their, all their hard work and uh, thank the community for your deep engagement. We've had really unprecedented amount of engagement. I think uh, Councilor Camps put it well. This is the most scrutinized development uh, in San Jose history and maybe in the history of virtually any city. Uh, and I, I also appreciate what Councilor Depp said. You know, before I became mayor, we had a redevelopment agency. Lots of companies got lots of subsidies. 
Uh, lots of folks got big tax breaks. Uh, lots of folks got big fee breaks. Um, and it wasn't because council insisted that Google pay full freight and not get any fee breaks. The very first conversation I had over the phone and subsequently in, in, in person with the senior team at Google, they were very clear. They were never going to ask for anything in terms of subsidies, fee breaks, tax breaks. We were all very clear on that. I told them we didn't have any money. They said, we're not going to ask for any of it. That's not what we're here for. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm proud that, frankly, since the time I've been mayor, we haven't been in the subsidy game. We haven't been in the tax break game or, or fee break game uh, when it comes to companies that moved here. And we've had an enormous amount of success and expansion because it's hard work and Nancy and Kim and Chris Burton and many, many others who've been working to make that happen, Rosalind. Um, and, you know, what we've seen while Amazon was asking for billion dollar breaks in other cities throughout the country, we said no thanks. Uh, and companies expanded here because uh, they were confident we could create an environment that they would succeed in. Now, not only did Google not ask for anything, but what they're giving is absolutely tremendous. And I know it's hard to take these pieces from throughout the presentation, but this is an unprecedented amount of commitment to a community already in what we've already seen in commitments through the memorandum of understanding with the council that was signed and approved uh, publicly uh, back in December, 2019. Uh, not only did they pay full price for the land and uh, to say full price, I think it's an understatement. It was about two and a half times what uh, prior property owners got for land only a year before in that same area, if you look at the square footage cost. So clearly the city and all the public agencies that benefited, school districts and everybody, did very, very well in those land sales um, by virtue of tens of millions of dollars in benefit. Uh, they've committed, even though they, they're not in the housing business, they committed to build what appears to be at least 4,000 units of housing. Obviously, that's going to depend on uh, rail alignments and so forth. Uh, but if they have the capacity, that's what they want to build. They're committing to 25% would be affordable. That'd be about 1,000 units of housing. I don't know too many uh, too many companies that commit to do that. Uh, that's totally independent, by the way, uh, of the fact that they made a regional commitment of a billion dollars of affordable housing here. Uh, they've got tens, if not hundreds of millions probably of infrastructure costs that they're picking up in parks and trails that clearly the city and the residents will see very plainly. And then things that the residents won't see or appreciate like a microgrid, uh, which we've been struggling for, for a couple of years now to find ways to get a microgrid built to try to provide some resilience in our city um, against what we know is happening with wildfires and power safety shutoffs and so forth. Uh, Google's investing considerably in, in something that will provide lasting benefit for us and hopefully a model for us and for other cities throughout the country. Uh, commercial impact fee they committed to in that MOU before we even passed one. And 100% of that money is being used for affordable housing, millions of dollars. Before we even approved a commercial impact fee, they said, we'll pay it. Uh, and then, of course, the community benefits that Nancy articulated that we're still trying to work out because we've got to figure out what exactly the development capacity is going to be here. And, and there's still a lot of things uh, that need to be aligned between cranes and railroads to figure all that out. Uh, and then of course, they performed the role that the redevelopment agency would have performed, uh, only they can do it much more quickly and much more effectively as a private agency, which is aggregating parcels uh, to be able to create, I think as Councilman Depp said well, uh, a, an urban village that is integrated where you can have retail and amenities and housing and jobs in a way that works because you've got one property owner. And what we saw happen at Santana Row worked because there was one property owner. It's very difficult to enable that kind of development to happen across a host of different property owners that have very different demands. And I can assure you uh, in my efforts in trying to get property owners to, get, to, to cooperate, whether it's downtown or uh, North 13th Street, it's incredibly difficult, especially if you need to, for example, to install a park or a plaza or some community amenity, I can assure you there's no property owner who wants that on their property. They want that in some other guy's property. Uh, in this case, you've got one property owner that can make it all happen in an integrated way that really benefits the community. So there's no question in my mind, this city is going to be, and this community is gonna benefit enormously from this. Uh, I'm confident staff is continuing to push in the right direction. And we're gonna keep pushing to make sure 
uh, that our residents and our community benefit. Uh, so we'll go to the public now. And I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, and I know that there are a series of uh, community members that form uh, from the immediate neighborhood surrounding um, uh, this, uh, this area. And I, I wanna make sure I get the order right because I know they put themselves into order. Uh, this is from the, uh, yeah, and I believe the person number one, I know they've numbered themselves here. Thank you. I think Henry may have assisted, uh, but there's six people who want to present. Mary Pizzo, I believe, was the first person. Uh, this is from the Deardon Area Neighborhood Group. Uh, Mary, are you with us? And Henry, help me if you're not, oh, there she is. Okay, I've been Great. unmuted, thank you. Welcome, wonderful, Mary. thank you, Henry. Um, Dang is the Dearden Area Neighborhood Group and we represent current residents of San Jose who have dedicated our personal and unpaid time to read, respond and participate in projects for decades that have improved our city. And you can see the neighborhoods we represent on the next slide. And you'll go to that one very quickly. Let's go to the next slide. The next slide is our mission. Oh, never mind. I'm sorry. And, and Mary, I'm sorry. I should have announced this at the beginning. Yes. I, I'm going to limit everyone to a minute because mm -hmm. I'm guessing we're going to have uh, an awful lot of uh, many, many community members who want to participate and we only have an hour. That's perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Um, based on our collective in experience and institutional knowledge, our specific concern is with the private non-Google development being proposed within the southwestern area of the DSAP, west of Highway 87. Next slide. We are concerned that an addendum to the 2018 DSAP EIR is insufficient to address equity issues of those height and density changes being proposed by planning. And Edward Straub will speak to this in the next slide. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Edward Straub? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, thank Edward, you, Mr. Edward Mayor. Stop. This is Edward Salm. Uh, much has changed since the 2014 plan. Obviously, land uses have been substantially changed and mixed, which we feel is vital if we're serious about responding to market demands and the housing crisis without leaving swaths of the area undeveloped. Uh, next slide, please. The proposed development capacity is an order of magnitude greater than the original. The amendment proposes an additional 14 million square feet of office space, a 285% increase condensed into a comparatively small footprint. The 110% retail increase cuts the ratio of retail to office in half, which doesn't encourage a true mixed use district. Residential units will increase by 488%. Without corresponding retail and with less than one third of the recommended parks and public open space, this is problematic at best. Next slide, please. Next is the increase in allowable building heights. In some places, this is three stories. In others, it is an additional 24 stories. While this is compatible with the council's extension of the downtown boundary to include the Deer Down Station area, it also creates new interface challenges that aren't typical of downtown. It's a bit disingenuous to embrace adjacency to downtown while dismissing the adjacencies that make it notably different. With that, I will defer to my friend, Kathy Sutherland from here forward. Thank you very much. Um, the work done by the SOG has not focused on neighborhood impact until recently. The SOG has been focused on policies, affordable housing, value capture, displacement, community benefit. In 2018, oh, I'm sorry, next slide, please. In 2018, council decided they would no longer follow the OEI guidelines and building heights were raised to up to 295 feet. There are huge benefits to increasing development and the DANG overwhelmingly supports these new heights. Our concerns have been in a few minor areas adjacent to existing neighborhoods. Next slide. The south side of San Carlos between Bird and Delmas is just three blocks long. On the other side of the descent boundary, which is in the middle of the block, 
is in an established neighborhood. This area is only three half blocks out of 240 acres. The October map eliminates the, the original 65 foot buffer and allows up to 295 feet next to existing single family homes. Next slide, please. The planning department is proposing a 75 degree view plane as a building height transition. This is just 15 degrees less than a solid wall up to 295 feet tall coming straight out of the ground next to historic homes. Next slide, please. And your next speaker will be Laura Winter. Okay, am I unmuted? Thank you. Uh, this uh, is from the Alameda Urban Village Plan and shows a concept we hope to replicate in the few areas of the, the DCEP that abut existing neighborhoods. High density mid-rise up to 100 feet at the front transitioning to two to three stories at the interface with the existing residential. This concept was developed with robust community input and guides developers towards a solution that is consistent with the plan and is highly acceptable to the adjacent neighborhood. Next. Another idea that needs dialogue is that of density versus height. Affordable housing is challenging in high-rise buildings due to the high cost of steel construction, which means high-rise is large luxury units, meaning lower densities. This project currently under construction will achieve high density in a building under 100 feet high. Next, please. The Modera building next to Whole Foods should be the poster child for mixed use development in the DCEP. 161 dwelling units per acre, under 100 feet high, with residential, commercial, and retail, and is well suited for the street and the adjacent neighborhood. And the next slide will go to my colleague, Bill Rankin. Thank you, Laura. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. The city has set a goal of three acres of open space per 1,000 residents. The total projected population of this development is going to be more than 20,000. This would put the parkland goal at 62 acres or the equivalent re re recreation amenities. The reality of COVID only heightens the need for adequate park or open space. Next slide, please. There are parks, plazas, and trails planned, but is, is it enough for 20,000 people? The city has talked about creating park space on the east side of Autumn Street. This would help. Separately, we cannot count the riparian setback as parkland. That setback is there to protect the health of the creek and its animals. There are other parks in the area. Take Arena Green. It is a wonderful open space with lots of grass to relax in or to play games or to con congregate in. However, we still do not know how much of this space will be reduced when the new signature sculpture gets in installed. Next slide, please. We need to carefully consider reducing PDO fees for any developer in our city. If Google pays full free, freight and other developers don't, is that fair to Google? They are the anchor for this Thanks. whole development. And if we let one developer get away without paying these fees, it sets a precedent for others. The city- Thanks, Bill. Line. Thank you. Hello, next, uh, uh, next slide. Please. Yeah. Okay, this is in regard to your 50,000 um, square foot proposed community center. I heard mention that there was community input. I'd like to know what community input that was. I know that uh, Gardner over here uh, south of the project and Google have been discussing programming at Gardner, not a new community center. Also, I am concerned about the need for a community center of this size, seeing how many of these residential developments will have their own facilities to entice people to move to their residences. Amenities like meeting rooms, weight rooms, possible indoor or rooftop pools will make having a traditional community center unnecessary or redundant. You need more open space, not a community center. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, the closest community center to the uh, Derridon Station area, you didn't even mention in this proposal or, or in your uh, words today, and that's insulting. Since its opening in 2004 with Measure P funds, um, it's been closed longer than it's been open for neighborhood use. 
before the city builds anything requiring um, uh, more community centers, they need to formulate a strategy to open and staff their current centers as Gardner, as well as many other centers, serve underserved minority neighborhoods. How does a new hub center in an affluent new neighborhood communicate social equity to Gardner and even the East Side Community Centers? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kevin. All right, Catherine Hedges. Welcome. Yeah, uh, good afternoon. Um, um, yeah, as you know, I'm a member of PACT and Catalyze SB. I also live downtown. I'm disabled, below extremely low income, rent burden, and can't afford to move. In other meetings, I've heard of people being displaced in the Duradon area by rent increases, even though downtown West will be vacant lots and construction sites for a decade. Houses are also being bought by speculators and left vacant. Because one of the goals of the project is to place jobs near a transit hub, this will make housing along the transit lines more valuable for workers who may otherwise locate in the suburbs. That's why I need to manage displacement of lower income residents near transit lines, not just in the Derridon area and immediate radius. And that's why we need to have all segments of the community represented on the Community Stabilization Fund Board, including the people served by organizations such as the CC Predi Collective, um, which is right on the major transit corridor and we have already seen large redevelopment place in our neighborhood. I don't know about other areas, but I presume the same things will happen there too. Because the community's economic needs and stability are intertwined, it doesn't make sense to demand the... Uh, thank you. Uh, Scott Neese. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members, Scott Neese, San Jose Downtown Association. Boy, we've come a long way since we were looking at a ballpark in 2014. How fortunate we are to have a developer that wants to build a livable, vital, equitable city within a city over on the west side of downtown. Kim asked us what we liked about uh, the project, and there's just so much to like here. So excited about the open space, the affordable housing, the density also asked about our concerns. We do have a few, namely the crane policy. I was happy to hear that aviation director John Aiken is going to get involved because it seems like deja vu with OEI. And we need to behave like a big city here and have a temporary exception when the cranes are up building. We also have some concerns about the traffic circulation and the parking. There's no north-south primary street in the DSAP plan. And also the core connections between downtown center and downtown west. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 5140. Yeah, the question I have for the council and everyone is how many, what kind of tax dollars are we looking at that's going to go into the project, be it uh, city, county, state, or federal? And I want to know, are the sharks going to disappear because you're not able to put proper parking in? Or are you going to have a pie in the sky idea that there's going to be no combustion engines within like a five mile radius or whatever? And so I just want to know like what your plans are for the SAP center parking and is there going to be ridiculous bike lanes like you have all over downtown so people can get citations because it's not intuitive to drive down there. And I mean, I mean, is this going to be like a boring glass and steel structure with, you know, looks really, looks really modern, but bad at the same time. I mean, this thing has to look cool. Furthermore, I hope there's no fake grass at these supports. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Jonathan Becker. Thanks, Sam. Uh, for 30 years, the SAP Center has helped the city of San Jose grow up around us. We've invested more than 200 million into the city-owned arena, and we've contributed more than 250 million per year to the local economy. I wanna make sure everyone knows on the council, conceptually, we're supportive of downtown redevelopment and increased use of public transportation. It's good for San Jose and could be good for us. But we are very much worried about the reductions in the street network, especially Santa Clara and Autumn Streets going from four car lanes down to two. That is our largest concern, especially for those all around the arena who use SAP Center 
but can't take advantage of public transportation now or at any point in the future. Constituents in many of your districts in San Jose and Morgan Hill and Los Gatos and Santa Cruz or the Central Valley. We're also asking for a better integration between all these projects. Construction management has to come sooner, not someplace later in the future. We don't want to leave. Don't force us out. Thank you. Uh, Sandra Weber. Hi, Sandra Weber. I sit on the SAG panel representing Plant 51. We're basically ground zero next to Deridon Station, and we're extremely excited. We've had, um, from the very beginning, Google consultants walk the neighborhoods with us. Um, two points. Uh, in the very beginning, we had more talk about east-west connectivity, and right there at the uh, where the station's um, entrance exit is at that San Fernando entrance. If you head west, you're right into Cahill Park. And <clears throat> we saw early on that there was a Paseo San Fernando where it would maybe connect even from SJSU all the way to the Rose Garden. So um, just the idea of that transportation on the west side, what does that look like? We have a lot of bottlenecking right there at Laurel Grove Lane. <clears throat> and the other question I had was, when can we do shared parking agreements for the Sharks, for existing buildings? Thank you. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 9912. Hello? Hi, welcome. Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name is Olivia Navarro. Thank you, Mayor, Council members and staff. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I wanna give a huge, and recognize a huge thank you to the staff and for all their work on this Zero Dawn Station development plan. Uh, once again, my name is Olivia Navarro. I'm a District 6 resident, and I come before you today to speak on behalf of Leuna Labor's Local 270, a union that represents more than 7,000 members, most of which will be impacted by the Zero Dawn Station, either because they live in San Jose, or hopefully they'll be working there and their kids will be working there. Leuna Labor's Local 270 would li also like to recognize the city's partner in this development project, Google. Google has had a great history in the Bay Area working with local unions and employing many of our members in many of the projects that they have done all over California. We are confident that when Google moves forward, it will create many jobs from construction, administrative, and retail. That it will stimulate our local economy, generate much needed revenue to the city of San Jose, and showcase that our city is an ever-evolving capital of the Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Navarro, my apologies. Um, Tessa Women C. Thank you, Thank you. Mayor Ricardo. Um, we are a community at risk. I am the founder of the Garden Alameda Village Association. And, you know, all I've been hearing about is how great your community output has been, but it really hasn't been. That I have tried to communicate with um, the uh, Lori Severino, who's supposed to be our civic engagement, that went very unsuccessfully. I have tried to communicate with my, my city council member, Deb Davis. That goes very unsuccessful. Also, um, Raul Perala's, it has not gone successful. We can blame this on COVID-19 and that it's very hard to reach our council members. But this, you know, in the age of innovation, we should not have that. And also your civic engagement, it should be a positive thing and it hasn't been. You have not done enough community outreach. And now we have this amended uh, general plan for the Diridon station, whereas the Google West is like a foot, foot wide, the environmental impact report. We have bypassed the environmental impact report in terms of the Diridon station, and that's wrong. Thank you. Uh, Rowan, LeBron. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Um, I, I'm extremely excited by the new street plan, but I believe that slide 93 is um, slightly out of date, while the slide 47 correctly depicts a Santa Clara Alton San Carlos quadrant dedicated to active transportation and also additional densification, 
which is enabled by the relocation of vehicle movements to the underground parking structures. I believe that's the answer to Scott Neeser's issue. With regards to the disc, it's unclear why anyone would expect world-class integration at Deridan from the same cast of characters who were incapable of integrating Bath with VK likely in Mill Peters. In closing, my recommendation to Council is to eliminate the disc Chris by integrating the disc into downtown West and incorporate this integration effort into the development agreement, starting with the integration of the landmark train depot into downtown West development plan. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Helen Doherty. Welcome. Thank you, Mary Helen Doherty here, a resident of District 3 and a member of the PACT housing team. We believe the downtown West project will impact far beyond the Deardon area and in the immediate mile around the area. We request that you consider supporting a wider geographic focus. The community benefits plan and the proposed community stabilization fund should be focused on neighborhoods most at risk of develop of displacement, not just in and around the Deardon area. Neighborhoods connected via transit lines to the station area will be impacted, including communities like Mayfair and many other neighborhoods the city has already identified as at high risk for displacement. Also a governance structure for the proposed community stab uh, stabilization fund is required that engages community impacted uh, members in the decision of how this funding will work to protect um, displacement uh, communities, affordable housing and workforce development for local residents. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the person with the phone number ending in 8650, welcome. Hi, this is uh, Jeff Morgan, uh, president of First Community Housing. I wanted to extend my complete support for uh, the plan for Deardon Station that Google is putting forward and just say that I have a, a great sense of gratitude uh, for their significant investment in our community to create 365 additional affordable housing units right next to what will be the Grand Central Station of the West Coast. Um, this will help many, many residents who otherwise might be displaced. We're anticipating a partnership with Google that will allow job training and many other amenities and housing exactly where we need it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. The person with the phone number ending 7567. Good evening, Mayor, City Council and staff. My name is Chad Dutton. I am representative for Carpenters Local 405 San Jose, and we represent over 4,000 members. I'd just like to say that we're excited to be a part of the conversation and helping Google um, with this concept development and we believe that Google is excited to invest in the workforce development programs that we have in place and help to design an ecosystem model that's gonna help bring retail, cultural arts, education, hotels, and other exciting avenues into downtown San Jose near the Shark Tank. And we'd like to be a part of that. And we say thank you very much and thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Chelsea Moore, welcome. Hello, thank you. Um, my name is Chelsea Miller. I'm speaking on behalf of Destination Home. We are pleased um, the draft Deardon Affordable Housing Implementation Plan envisions a mix of affordable housing units across all income levels and includes the potential for a substantial portion of the housing units to be affordable to extremely low income households. As we know, extremely low income households are some of the most vulnerable members of our community, severely rent burdened and left with far fewer affordable housing options. Uh, there are currently just 30 affordable uh, and available units for every 100 extremely low income households in the San Jose metro area. And this is one of the greatest contributing factors to our community's growing homelessness crisis. A focus on extremely low income housing also enables the leveraging of key local funding sources as the Measure A housing bond is designated for extremely low income housing and permanent supportive housing. We urge you to remain focused on prioritizing the development of more extremely low income housing units in the Deardown plan, as it will help facilitate a more equitable development in our downtown area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ben Leach. 
Thank you, uh, Ben Leach, Preservation Action Council of San Jose. Um, comment uh, mostly on the Deer Island Station area plan. Um, the cover of that plan, you, you may have noticed, is a picture of a very attractive modern train station. Um, I wasn't sure where it was with a little research. It's Denver's Union Station. What's not in the picture um, and is cropped off is the historic station house uh, that made that project the award-winning fusion of new design and historic uh, restoration that, that made it successful. Um, currently, Deridon Station, the, the historic resource, is an afterthought. Uh, quite literally, it uh, is being addressed after all the other pieces um, are figured out, and that's unacceptable. I think that uh, we're looking at uh, losing that station because we're not being proactive about planning for its preservation and adaptive reuse. Um, it's not part of the Google development, um, but uh, somebody needs to take charge and assure that the preservation of that building is um, being pursued. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Priscilla Kuna. Hi, my name is Priscilla Cunyamena. I'm a program manager at Working Partnerships USA. So we've heard loud and clear today from folks on the metaphorical dais that Google's being subjected to a greater level of scrutiny than any company before it. I do hear that. And I also think that it's past, dues for, past due for cities like San Jose to do things differently. Doing things the old way in Silicon Valley has only led to the status quo, where entire families are crammed into studio apartments, or else thousands of working people are suffering unacceptable daily commutes from Stockton to the Bay Area. I will say that we're really glad to hear of the Planned Community Stabilization Fund and urge that for this commitment to be truly meaningful, it must be overseen with strong community governance that includes representation as well as decision-making power from the people most impacted by these issues. Thank you so much to staff for all the work that has gone into this and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Ken Pyle, welcome. Ken, you appear to be muted right now. If you could unmute your device. Okay. I apologize for that. Thank you for, uh, thank you for that. And uh, th there's a lot to like about this plan. Um, uh, just a couple of comments. I'm sure Director Aiken will uh, figure out the right thing on the crane policy um, to ensure safety. Uh, while we're on the topic of the airport and microgrid, uh, it would be great if we could look at the lands, the fallow lands at the airport and uh, see how we might be able to add to the microgrid capability. And finally, regarding the sharks, we all want to keep the sharks and maybe there's a win-win-win for everyone. Uh, perhaps we should be looking at how could we build over Highway 87 at Santa Clara Street, actually cap it, create kind of a combination mixed use building uh, where it incorporates parking and incorporates community spaces, art spaces, open space, it's done in Boise. If you go to Jump Boise, you can see what Simplot did to create a multi-use uh, garage slash uh, space. And I think that could be done here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Elma Arredondo. Good afternoon. My name is Elma Arredondo. I've lived in San Jose for 42 years and I worked downtown at San Jose State University for almost 30 years. I live in District 5 on Alum Rock at the Las Mariposas Affordable Housing for First-Time Homeowners in the east side by the Mayfair community. It's just in the last 15 years that I have been able to be a homeowner. Prior to buying into this affordable housing development, I was seriously considering leaving San Jose because of home prices and unaffordability of renting. Displacement is a serious issue for many residents of San Jose. The community benefit agreement dollars needs to be directed to anti-displacement and it can't just benefit the Deridon area. The project affects residents outside of the targeted Deridon area also. Um, so community oversight needs to be focused not on just the Deridon, but all the areas at risk of displacement. And I'm looking forward to the continued community discussions on this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alicia Vigil. Good afternoon, Alicia Vigil on behalf of the Bay Area Council here to express strong support for Downtown West. 
We represent over 350 member organizations and work to promote responsible public policy that will maintain the Bay Area as economically vibrant, sustainable, and equitable. Key to this is addressing our housing crisis, as well as the climate crisis, and it's critically important to construct housing at transit hubs and adjacent to job centers, reducing sprawl and getting people out of cars and into transit. Deardown Station exemplifies the sort of high capacity transit hubs where dense urban housing and job centers should be concentrated. We, we at the Bay Area Council are working on MTC's current initiative to re reduce VMT and we can expect aggressive VMT mandates from the Air Quality Board. It's gonna be necessary to build housing near transit and jobs to comply. Google's proposal does just this. Thank you. Thank you. Olivia, welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Olivia Ortiz, and I am part of Vecinos Activos, and I live in District 5. Uh, Google funds should be um, used for affordable housing, definitely, especially for extremely low-income housing. The funds should be distribu distributed all over San Jose to districts that are facing a high percentage of displacement or are under displacement. Let's focus on, on underserved communities that will be the most impact with all this um, development. So let's just make sure that the community benefits from, from those funds. And I am, I am also uh, for their, their don't plan that they should include um, affordable housing, but we also need more affordable housing, especially in, in, all, in all over San Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nico, welcome. Uh, hello, Mayor, uh, City Council members, thank you for your time. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Bay Area Housing Advocacy Coalition, a regional nonprofit advocating for building housing at all levels of affordability uh, to solve our housing crisis. Um, while we haven't yet had the opportunity to review uh, the residential piece of the proposal um, in as much detail as we'd like, we generally believe uh, that this type of expansion is a worthy idea, adding jobs and housing near transit, is a much needed step in the right direction uh, for the city of San Jose and the region as a whole. Um, as I said, appreciate your time and have a good evening. Thank you. Uh, Kiyomi? I'm Kiyomi Yamamoto. I'm the lead policy attorney at the Law Foundation and a San Jose resident. There are three items I'd like you to consider around the stabilization fund. Uh, strong community governance. The community should have the primary role in the governance and decision making of the fund. This helps to ensure that the fund's people serving purpose is well defined and executed. There should be one fund and not multiple funds. It's efficient and maximizes the ability to leverage the fund for future investment. And lastly, the fund should be focused on neighbors most at risk of displacement, including those within and beyond the Dearden area, keeping in mind that displacement disproportionately affects people of color and women. As a community serving, serving legal aid organization, we see the devastating effects of displacement and lack of resources on a daily basis. We must use the tools available to us, like this fund, to empower the community to address San Joseans most at need. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matthew Reed. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, and City staff. Matthew Reed, Silicon Valley at Home. As a member of the stationary advisory group, we've been deeply engaged in all phases of this planning process. We are encouraged by the work city staff have undertaken to fulfill the vision of a vibrant urban mixed use Deardon neighborhood that is connected to the largest transit hub in the region and accessible to people of all incomes, backgrounds and abilities. Achieving this vision requires that the city and this council continue to plan for a bolder, more inclusive future. We continue to support the staff's proposed housing rich station area plan with at least 25% of the new homes being affordable. To get there, we cannot afford to add additional constraints. This will only work if we maintain the appropriate heights for residential sites as initially proposed by staff. We also wanna thank the housing departments for their analysis of the affordable uh, housing and displacement issues and we look forward to providing more detailed comments in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Alex Shore, welcome. 
Thank you so much to city staff and to Google for enabling Catalyze SV and our members to be involved in this project and process. Our members are excited to help facilitate small group discussions at a workshop this Saturday that we're doing for the artist and creative community to make sure that their voices are heard as part of this project. And our members were also excited to evaluate and score this project. And we'll be talking more about their perspectives in the weeks and perhaps months ahead. So thank you all for your work on this important project. Let's get the best possible project built. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa and Hum. Hi, how are you? My name is Melissa Nam, and I work as a loan officer with Housing Trust Silicon Valley. I entered the affordable housing field because when I moved to downtown San Jose, I encountered people who were unhoused every day as they camped behind my apartment building. In an area with so much innovation and prosperity, I knew that I wanted to be a part of the solution to this incredibly complex problem. I studied public health at Columbia University, and research tells us if we want people to be healthy, if we want people to be well and thriving, we need to ensure that they have not only their physical needs met, but their social needs as well. The Deridon Station Area Plan supports the economic, social, and residential needs of our community. Additionally, this holistic development of a neighborhood that has incredible access to public transportation will also support equity of access in a healthier environment. Finally, the inclusion of affordable housing among market rate housing will open up new, op new opportunities for people with low incomes as resources are shared and social connections among different groups are made possible. It's no news that we need more housing in San Jose for, all peop for people of all incomes and abilities. So I ask the city council to support the staff proposal to build at least uh, 15,000 new homes in the Deer Down Station area and ensure at least 25% of, uh, of these new homes are affordable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Victor Vasquez. Good afternoon. As the downtown West project or this development continues, we will see the impact beyond downtown. We understand that major development downtown will impact East San Jose. And during this pandemic, we have seen that the housing crisis, the need for resources has not slowed down, disappear for those impacted by racism, low wages and gentrification. We know racism is a system that excludes people from decisions and a fair share of the resources, but we also know that racial justice can do the quite opposite. We must create opportunities for decision making and ensure that our resources are redistributed to the communities most impacted. Given that, we believe in three things. The Community Benefits Plan and Stabilization Fund must focus on neighborhoods most at risk of displacement, both in and around the Deardon area, in areas like Mayfair and Santi. We must also call for a strong community governance that represents the needs and impacts of the communities most at risk. And we must make sure that this fund is unified into one. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, welcome, Mike. This is Mike with Preservation Action Council San Jose. My comments are directed to the city I love, the council I love, the staff I love, and the Project Titan who has grown up here and we have grown around their applications and love them. Uh, with many of its workers, I might add, who are working in their home office during a pandemic here in San Jose. Please see the value to all of us in saving as much of San Jose's unique historic fabric as possible. Specifically, please avoid a sequa driven mess on the back end of this project by committing right now to each other to honoring the historic landmark Duradon Station by saving it, preferably in place. The current document, unfortunately, is devoid of preservation goals. I, I ask that you correct this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marcy Gersten. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is Marcy Gersten. I'm a member of PAC's housing team. I appreciate the time that staff and city council gave to this today. And I also appreciate the presentation of the DANG as to how they've had their concerns about the transitional areas and height restrictions addressed. Like the neighborhoods represented by DANG, other neighborhoods are impacted by the Downtown West project beyond the Deerdon area, beyond downtown, and beyond the immediate area around the, DSAP, the, the DSA. 
You've heard today and at prior com community meetings that people on the east side and other areas of this city are already feeling the effects of the proposed project through displacement or the threat of displacement. Please keep other neighborhoods at risk of displacement in mind as you move forward with the community benefit aspects of the development agreement and the community stabilization fund. Thank you. Thank you. Gene Dresden. Thank you. I'm Jean Dresden with San Jose Park Advocates. Thank you to staff and Google for the multiple meetings with us regarding parks and open space concepts and design. We appreciate that Google is thinking about how to integrate activation as a key part of open space design, but it's not clear that the activation strategies they've described will be welcome to families or persons who want to recreate without the requirement to spend money. Greater clarity is needed. We are concerned that the public park and plazas are inadequate for the number of residents who are proposed for the area. And while major residential growth will arrive in the first phases, they will be inadequately served with the larger public parks destined for phase three and positioned next to office space far from the residents. We are very troubled that the proposed publicly open, public city owned parks are the only spaces that are at risk from high-speed rail and disc construction and acquisition. If the city is going to depend on privately owned open space to serve its residents, policies about equitable access and how the space is operated must be resolved before the plan is approved. Thank you. Uh, Gabriel Hernandez. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Welcome. Yeah, uh, Gabriel Hernandez with Somos Mayfair. Um, just uh, thank you for all the work that the staff has done on this uh, project. A couple of things. One, um, when we're talking about uh, affordable housing, that we continue to uh, make sure that um, people are conscious and, and include extremely low income to make it truly affordable for families um, that are way below the the income of what it, what's considered affordable in San Jose. Um, and two, that um, we know that bringing in 20,000 people um, is gonna have its impact not only in the Dirdon area, but throughout San Jose. And so that any resources that Google might uh, put forward, that that be um, to address the, the extremely um, impacted areas of gentrification and um, displacement. You know, again, uh, you have the, the study that was done by UC Berkeley showing the dark purple and purple areas throughout San Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matt Gustison, I believe that's our final speaker. Yes, good afternoon, uh, council and mayor and staff. Thank you again for all your work on this presentation. Um, I, my name is Matt Gustafson. I'm a resident of District 3. Uh, I live in the Roosevelt Park neighborhood, and I'll, I'll pick up where Gabrielle left off, talking about um, the Housing Department's community strategy to end displacement, which has a lot of maps in there, um, particularly showing that there's a lot of neighborhoods in District 3, 6, and 5, and other districts in San Jose that are at risk of displacement or are experiencing ongoing displacement. And so I just, I have noticed personally that there's a lot of residential and commercial buildings for sale in these neighborhoods, particularly down East Santa Clara and Elm Rock that cite the Google project and have been citing the Google project for years since it was announced. And so um, with that under consideration, I just wanna suggest that the community benefits agreement should expand its area to include more neighborhoods at risk of displacement, particularly down Santa Clara and Elm Rock. Uh, prioritize community stabilization and displacement mitigation. And then also, as Gabrielle said, um, to prioritize a extremely low and very low income housing in the affordable housing allocation. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank all the members of the community who came to speak today uh, virtually. And uh, thank you for your continued engagement with us. I know we have uh, many more uh, community meetings uh, in the next actually i think in the next two weeks we've got several i was about to try to pull up the schedule i know it was up on the screen a minute ago uh but uh just to summarize uh november 13th we've got a transit walking biking and the dsap tour 
November, oh, I'm sorry, that already happened. Excuse me, November 18th is the uh, Parks and Rec Commission focus uh, on downtown West. Uh, November 20th at 5 p.m. we'll have a cafecito hosted by Somos Mayfair. On the 21st of this week, um, two to four community workshop for artists and creatives. December 2nd, planning commission study session. And December 3rd, community meeting on DSAP and housing implementation plan. So we've got a lot coming up and many more meetings after that. So I encourage community to continue to stay engaged. Uh, thank you again to staff for the excellent presentation. Uh, I believe uh, that then concludes our session and we've got lots more work and lots more discussion to have in the months ahead. So thank you all.